Welcome, everybody, and um, welcome to the unbelievable eighth virtual meeting of the Service Delivery Committee since we last had our meeting in March in 2020. It seems amazing, doesn't it? Um, eight meetings. Um, right, let's start off. We've got a, um, a, a very interesting and packed agenda as ever, as ever for the Service Delivery Committee, and um, I'll just do a few welcomes. Welcome, Gregor. Um, very last minute notice uh, with Chris Fitzpatrick um, uh, not being able to attend. And um, also we have, um, I'll jump onto this in a second, but it's relevant for this point is that uh, Richard Wetton has had to uh, disappear off at short notice. So you're, um, I won't say you're by yourself because you'll be ably supported by your colleagues, but uh, thanks for stepping in at the last minute there. Thank you very much. Welcome also to uh, Robert, who joined us as an uh, attendee from HMFSI, and also Rick, who joins us um, as uh, a guest. Let's just uh, remind ourselves of the virtual meeting pro uh, protocol, which we're all pretty familiar with now. And when you first introduce yourself, I wonder whether or not you could just say your uh, name and your position you occupy. And also, if you wish to speak, just raise your hand and um, Hopefully I'll see that if I don't see that and I'm operating from two screens and no paper on this occasion. So please just wave at me and I will endeavor. Endeavor to come to you. Um, that being said, my name is Nick Barr and I'm the chair of the service delivery committee and a board member. Our timings uh, will be that we'll take a break at about 1130 uh, and then a quick five minute comfort break. And then we'll be finishing hopefully just before one o'clock before we then start again for a private session around 1.15 where we'll be looking at operations control resilience management. I've already mentioned Richard Wetton's uh, apologies and also Kirsty's apologies for the morning session only. Uh, there could be a chance that Brian Baverstock, another board member from the Audit and Risk Committee may join us for this morning session. So after that rather complicated uh, introduction, let's crack on now with the agenda and we've covered off apologies for absence unless there is. Is there anything else I've missed out of that, um, Ali? Uh, no, sure. OK, thank you. Is, are there any items that uh, anybody has seen that uh, you believe we should be taking in private or indeed anything that we um, had planned to take in private that we're not? Oh, OK, thank you. Any declarations of interest that may affect uh, today's business either now or uh, during the meeting? If that is the case, please um, let me know and we'll take the due action. Robert, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, Robert Scott, uh, Our Majesty's Chief Inspector of the Scottish Fan Rescue Service. Uh, just the same declaration of interest that I gave at the last meeting with regard to uh, my former role as a consultant uh, and the paper that I wrote regarding Grenfell Tower. So the same words that were used in the last minute would be appropriate again on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you for that, Robert, and Debbie will no doubt note. Thank you. Can we now move to the minutes of the meeting on the 24th of November? I won't go through page by page, but does have anybody have anything they'd like to bring up? Um, Malcolm. Uh, thanks, Chair. Malcolm Payton, board member. A uh, couple of uh, fairly minor things, but wording one in 7.3, uh, I notice it says, it says assured the committee. Uh, I really would prefer provided assurance. <laughs> I know it sounds minor, but assured the committee always to me sounds like he told us it was all wonderful. I, I re recall that he did a lot more than that. He told us about the backup arrangements and how it worked, and we got assurance from that. So I, I, I if that's OK, I would just prefer to say provided assurance. <coughs> that I think is stronger and more accurate. Uh, Thank you. I, I agree. I'm sure Stuart wouldn't have any problem with that. Thank you. Right. Uh, another one was in 818. Uh, just to mention, there's a, a phrase there that I, 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 if we're happy with it, it's fine. It says the potential negative impact of robust focus. That sounded a little bit like if if we provide focus, uh, that 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 is a negative impact. So I, I just wanted to check we were happy with the the wording there, or whether there was a better wording to explain what we were thinking at that point. Uh, Stuart, do you have any comment to make on that? 
Yeah, I think the wording could be changed or amended to, to reflect the discussion that took place. But essentially, it's it's to 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 make sure that there's we don't drive negative behaviours by focusing on uh, response times in the wrong manner. So I'm happy to provide that alternative wording to the board support team for that chair. Thank you, and uh, Malcolm, um, I'm happy with that too. If that uh, suffices. I'm very happy with that. Thank you. And I agree with you, thank Malcolm. Thank you for bringing that up. Anything further, Malcolm? No, that's fine. Thanks. And does anybody else have any further points to do with the minutes of the previous meeting? No. Nope. Nope. OK, thank you. I'm just scrolling down the, the um, you'll have to forgive my slightly clunk clunky chairing of this. Um, I've just got to scroll a great deal. OK, uh, that takes us to um, Ali Cameron and the action log, but there were no outstanding actions. Is that correct, Ali? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, no outstanding actions for this uh, last meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And further now to item seven, um, the service delivery update report, and over to the um, deputy chief officer, Ross Haggett. Thanks, Chair. One and all, um, as the chair said, I'm Ross Haggett, deputy chief officer. Um, and I'm going to present the, the update report. Uh, in case I forget to do this at the end, I'll say at the start, many thanks to colleagues within Service Delivery and Training Safety and Assurance Directorates who put all the work into this update report. This particular report covers the period from the 4th of November 2021 until the 4th of February 2022. However, as we've previously discussed and as committee members will be familiar, some of the actions predate that and, and go on beyond it as well. Although everything within the report should be a highlight, uh, and as I'll pick out some key things that I think are probably worthy of particular mention. Um, the first is the operational strategy. There's a lot of work has gone into the operational strategy, and I know that the committee have previously had presentations on it, and that's um, very close to publication at the moment. It's um, it's been it's going through the governance routes. It was very recently at the senior management board, and it will be continued through its, its governance. A really good piece of work that sets up the operations function for how we will operate going forward. So again, thanks to the teams who've been involved in its creation. It would be appropriate to mention COP26 as well. And um, from an SFRS point of view, we had a, an extremely successful. COP26 from a, a, a resilience perspective. Again, a lot of work put in place by the dedicated team that coordinated our activities uh, in the, the run up to and during the conference itself. Uh, and that includes operational teams and also prevention teams as well. And a huge amount of work was done. The team has now been um, effectively disbanded. Uh, with the exception of Area Commander Jim Quinn, who remains in post because he's undertaken a fairly comprehensive lessons learned piece of work so that we can learn all the lessons that we can from a fairly significant piece of planning and an extremely significant event. Members are probably also aware that we uh, published the fire investigation report into the Glasgow School of Art fire. Uh, there was a fair bit of um, media and stakeholder attention, as I'm sure you can appreciate with something again as significant as that. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure members will be aware of the findings of the investigation and also our recommendations that have come from it. It's probably also worthy at this point to highlight the youth volunteer scheme. Uh, as you're aware, it's a real commitment of ours, the Youth Volunteer Scheme, as part of a number of our initiatives in working with young people. The reason I'm particularly highlighting that um, is to, first of all, pay credit to the uh, youth volunteers and the young people who are part of the schemes. It's not been an easy two years for anybody, and it's been particularly challenging for the um, volunteer leaders and also the young people who have um, continued to engage, but through uh, means such as teams that we're using today. The reason I particularly highlight it is there's a really excellent evaluation report that's been done on the um, youth volunteer scheme. Again, it came to SMB last week and it will now 
uh, go through a governance route, which will probably take it to the change committee as the responsible committee because it was a major project. But I think it's also really useful that it will. Uh, my recommendation is that it will come to the full board as well, because it's an, an excellent evaluation, an excellent piece of work that uh, I'm sure will come to the full board in due course once it goes through its governance route. I would also like to highlight some excellent work that's been done by our property team in Inverness. Um, as you know, we're committed to um, being an, an employer of choice, and that includes equality, diversity and inclusion. And there's been an excellent piece of work that's been undertaken at Inverness, not just Inverness, but Inverness has now been completed in terms of dignified facilities, which has really upgraded the facilities there. A reasonable proportion of our um, workforce at Inverness are, are females and it's had a really positive impact the the upgrading of those facilities to make them uh, much more dignified facilities and it, it just shows our ambition unfortunately um, we, you know we're constrained financially in terms of how many of these projects we can roll out but it just shows you know our ambition in that regard of what we can do when we're able to do so i'd probably also highlight um the significant work that's been undertaken at a Scottish Government level post Storm Arwen, which was, um, I was going to say it was unprecedented at the time, um, a red warning for the northeast of Scotland in respect of wind, and it did have quite devastating effects on communities and Scottish Government were very keen to learn the lessons from that, and we've, we've had another four named storms since. So, uh, unfortunately, what appeared to be an unprecedented event is now becoming more and more precedented, and it probably ties in with the presentation that you'll get later on in terms of the wildfire strategy, which is again something that we're reacting to changes to, to our environment. But we fed into the uh, work that was undertaken and coordinated by Scottish Government through the um, resilience structures and um, some real lessons learned, which um, paid dividends when we then went into the other storm events that followed uh, hot on the heels of storm uh, Arwen. And the last thing I would probably want to highlight is in the operational training section, and it's in relation to um, the Trainee Foundation Programme, which is running at the moment at the National Training Centre. For the first time, in order to increase the throughput of trainees, we've moved to a four-on, four-off model. So there's effectively two cohorts of trainees coming through the training centre at the same time on a four off a four on four off basis. Um, as, you're, as you're aware, um, our recruitment and our training of trainees was impacted by COVID because of our need to maintain social distancing. So part of the recovery plans to get back to our target operating model for whole time firefighters involves increasing the throughput of trainees and we've got a four on four off system, so we can effectively double the number of trainees that are going through the National Training Centre at this time. Um, ACU Dick is obviously on the call if you've got any specific queries on that, but it has been extremely well received by both the trainees and the instructional staff. So it looks like a really positive initiative that's ongoing and certainly something that we would look to learn the lessons from going forward. That's all I want to highlight, Chair. A lot of information in there, though, I'm quite happy to either myself or ACOs, Stevens or Dickie to answer any questions that you might have in relation to the content. So thank you. Thank you indeed, Ross, and thanks, as you say, to all your colleagues for that uh, report. I continue to be impressed by the report and um, we've commented uh, on, on the comprehensive nature of it in previously, and um, that continues. I'll open it's up to comments from colleagues. Uh, Tim. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Tim Wright, member of the Service Delivery Committee, a member of the board. Uh, thanks, Ross. Great update. Um, just in passing, I'll mention how pleased I am to hear about the dignified facilities getting put in Inverness. Um, and whilst I accept all that you say around, you know, the constraints that we face on these capital projects, these are, for me, minor capital projects, and we need to press ahead with them as a priority. But it's excellent news that we've made progress in Inverness. I just wanted one one 
point of clarification, it's on the command and control futures. So, John, this is probably for you. There is mention in the overall position statement around penetration testing. And I wondered if the, what you're referring to there has a connection to the penetration testing that was, that was done, undertaken generally across the service, or whether this is a separate piece of work that is specifically for command and control futures. There's just really a clarification. Thanks. Tim, just before John answers, could you just cue us in onto where you're referring to on the document, please? So we can just get the context. I can. It is on page uh, 12 of that section and page 23 of the pack and the overall position statement, uh, second chapter, a second paragraph of that. Two of these risks reflect concerns around the okay. supplier's capacity to address issues arising from the pen penetration testing phase. Thank you. Chair, you happy to make a man now? Yes, definitely, John. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good morning, colleagues. Uh, John Dickey, ACO, Director of Training, Safety and Assurance. Um, Tim, it's a completely different pen test. Um, it's one that's specific for Sustel. It's contractually obliged. They're contractually obliged to pen test the the system. Um, so it, it run it's, it will run it runs in parallel to what's already been done. Um, but it's uh, completely separate and it's particularly for Sustel system. It's very helpful, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Um, colleagues, any more questions on the service delivery update report? Angelina. Uh, thank you. Angelina Foster, board member and member of this committee. Um, again, echoing comments, really incredibly useful report, and I love the way it's succinct but packed with information. Each topic is really sort of brisk. So, um, having had an earlier moan about some overly lengthy, uh, documentation. This is just um, a model of um, sort of punchy info. Um, my the reference for my comment is um, in and around page 19, but it's a broader theme. It's a COVID related question. So, for example, on page 19 under COVID recovery, the report deals with one issue, which is home fire safety visits. Fair enough, but it flags in that that we're now delivering the full program couple of topics down on the youth volunteer scheme which you flagged Ross it is then saying once face-to-face -face delivery can go ahead 13 schemes da, 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 da. so my question is around the the broader um return to pre-covid is there a place where a, a, if you like a more holistic um set of planning is happening it's not specific to director rates or topics, but is saying this is the master plan for return to whatever the new norm. Do you see, do you see my question? So, um, because at some point I would find it extremely helpful to have that drawn together in one place from a service delivery perspective, rather than on a necessarily topic by topic basis. I can cover them. Thanks. Oh, I'm getting an echo. Um, thanks, Chair. Thanks for that, Angelina. I'm actually providing a presentation to the Information Development Day tomorrow on our approach to um, all things recovery, reset, and renew from COVID and how that's been governed within the organisation. And I'll, I'll provide a, a kind of a strategic overview of how we're managing that. And then I'll dip into certain areas as well. And then that will also lead into a, a conversation, hopefully with the boards tomorrow, regarding the oversight and scrutiny of that work and next steps. So I'm happy to answer any specific questions just now, um, or I'm equally happy to wait until that conversation tomorrow, and we'll be providing a full up update anyway. No, thank you for me. Come back, Nick. That's great. You'll gather I haven't yet done my prep for tomorrow, so that's but that's perfect to know that that is in the pipeline. That absolutely will cover um, where I was coming from. Thank you. Bro. Thank you. Uh, thanks to both. Um, a good question and one that's obviously going to uh, seep into many different aspects of of, uh, of our oversight. Does anybody else have any further questions on the service delivery update report? No, OK. 
Thank you very much, Ross um, and team. Excellent paper, as Angelina said. Let's move now to um, Gregor and item eight, service delivery performance reporting. And over, you, over to you, Gregor, to take us through um, how we did in quarter three. Thank you very much. Um, as, as has been mentioned, I'm standing in for Chris Fitzpatrick. Um, I have not had the chance to prepare the script that, that he usually has, so apologies at the outset if this does not seem as practiced as you're used to. Um, he has asked me to pass on one comment before I begin, which is that the, uh, the discussion on the commentary on the first page in relation to um, effecting entry and exit um, is not statistically compatible with later in the document. This was a, a, a one off analysis to see how things have changed over time and does include some weeks in January and the first week of February as well. So you wouldn't be able to replicate that from elsewhere on the document. Apologies for that uh, oversight. Um, I will share my screen with you so you can see the the dashboard that Chris has, has developed. Um, please let me know if you can see this. Oh, we can see that now, Gregor. Thank you. Excellent. So the I'll, I'll aspire to cover the salient points essentially here. Um, one of the most notable things that we've seen uh, and, and statistical changes is the number of deliberate fires that we've seen year to date. Uh, there was a considerable increase over the, the spring, uh, summer and autumn last year. Um, we see significant seasonal variation in outdoor fires with considerable volatility. Um, and, and so that's within the normal range essentially of, of what we would expect to see but it is a notable increase in the number of deliberate fires um, and I, I understand more will be discussed on on wildfires later uh, in this, this session as well um, the the next point that i think is particularly relevant is the considerable increase in multi-agency incidents attended year to date um, there has been there had been relative stability for a couple of years and we've seen quite a significant increase um, in this last year um, the final point that I think is probably relevant in this is that the state of false alarms, it continues to be a significant part of operational demand, with UFAS being uh, the most significant component of that. Um, I'll continue on to the summary overview. Um, so looking mainly at the, at the red points here, the refuse and vehicle fires has not uh, reduced uh, in line with the ambition on on that, it is relatively similar to previous to previous years. Uh, similarly, the number of fatalities and fires uh, and accidental dwelling fires are similar to the three year average um, and 21 for accidental dwelling fires and 29 compared to 30 for fire fatalities. This continues the, uh, the, the recent uh, years average of around 40 per year. Um, so we haven't seen the desired reduction there. Um, the next point I think is particularly relevant and may stand out to, to readers of this paper is around retained duty system appliance availability, where we saw a, a reduction to 74% overall. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that we saw um, last year significant increases in availability during the lockdown periods. And so what we've experienced month on month is a significant spike in uh, availability during lockdowns and then uh, an overshoot down essentially so that we had slightly less than average availability for a period of time but in the most recent months it has returned to normal levels so just to provide you some assurance that that has returned to to normal the final point i think it's worth mentioning in here is on uh, road traffic collisions which similarly reduced significantly during um, during the covid period but have since returned to a relatively normal figure below the 2019-20 figure but still a significant uptick on, on what we saw last year. Moving on then to the prevention section, where, uh, as, as you will have heard in previous quarters, there has been a significant uh, increase in, um, in home fire safety visits and enforcement activity compared to last year, but not, uh, not returned to the full levels that we'd seen previously. It's worth noting, uh, as, as I'm sure Chris has done in the past, that the uh, attempt to safeguard vulnerable groups during the COVID period um, was was statistically successful that we saw a much uh, higher rate of home fire safety visits for the highest risk than for, for other parts of the community. And similarly, we, we've seen uh, those figures are much closer to the historic average. I will drill through 
um, using one of these nice features that Chris has anticipated my needs for, uh, just to show you some assurance uh, that we, we saw relatively stable home fire safety visits, significant drop during the COVID period, and since then a return um, to, to, to higher levels. Um, and we can see that also for the high risk that it is a much more significant return to, to the higher levels. Please ignore this final point. That's that's just the remnants of this quarter. Um, and I think reflects the, the fact that we're trying to improve this dashboard and get it to a state that it's really usable in the long term. Um, I'll return to the report. So the other thing that I think I wanted to note on was accidental dwelling fires, where we have seen um, the number of fire casualties has continued to reduce, um, which is very pleasing news and continues the long term trend. Um, and indeed, if we were to look at the, the breakdown of, of fires, what we see is that the reduction in accidental dwelling fires has been principally in the low and medium severity and that we have seen in the last two to three years some stability in the figures for the highest risk accidental dwelling fires. Um, the other thing on this page that I think is particularly notable, we've discussed uh, retained availability, is the call handling times and overall response times which we'll come on to, where we have seen an increase year uh, to date for for call handling, particularly in the north, where there has been a, an increase from 1.72 to 1.77. Um, we have seen some shift in uh, operational response times as a distribution, uh, and that is something that we're investigating actively and taking to the Continuous Improvement Forum in March. Um, we're looking to, to understand the reasons uh, in a more granular way uh, and taking uh, the advice and insight from service delivery colleagues on that. Um, and you can see similarly from the the heat chart uh, that Chris has produced on response times there that it is a similar picture overall, um, but there'll be a myriad of factors influencing that. Um, that covers all of the, the most salient points that I identified. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gregor. Thank you very much indeed. Absolutely no apologies required from you. Thank you. Um, in fact, the only apology should be that I overste I over um, I overstepped. Stuart there where he was the director responsible for that. So uh, Stuart, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll apologise to you personally and say, is there anything you care to add to that? Thank you. And good morning, uh, both uh, members and, and the committee. Um, Stuart Stevens, Assistant Chief Officer and Director of Service Delivery. Um, no, Nick, there's nothing else I'd like to add. I think Gregor's done a very sterling job, particularly with such short notice for stepping in for Chris. So um, I'm happy to take any questions along with Gregor on the content of the performance report. Great, thank you. I didn't see the order that went up, but uh, let's go with uh, Malcolm Leslie, then Tim, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you again. I'm really impressed, not only with the report, but the, the fact that it's live that you can drill down is just fantastic. Like it's the second time we've seen that, and it, it's a different league. It really is. The, the, the reports were good in the past, but that's just a, a, an amazing development. And um, no, just one uh, that you've not mentioned. That I, I just want to ask a little bit about non-refuge secondary fires. Uh, I'm looking at page 33 of the report. There's a a paragraph. Well, there, there are the charts there, and then there's a paragraph on the left that says non-refuge secondary fires have increased by almost 30 percent, which has been significantly influenced by a 50 percent increase in quarter two. So, so I would just uh, like to get a bit of insight into what the the non-refuge secondary fires are. And I suppose there's another question there. That's one we don't have a specific target. It's just on one that we monitor and, and look at how we're much. So I, I just wonder, um, is there a reason that we can't have a target there? Is that something we should consider uh, when we look at targets? Thank you. Shall I, I fill this short or would you like to? If, if, you, yeah, if you're happy to pick up the targets part, I can I can expand on the, the non refuse secondary files part. Grant, um, sorry, so non-refuse secondary fires are typically small outdoor fires um, on, on land, grassland predominantly. Um, so I, I understand wildfires are going to be discussed later on. Some component of those will be larger, but the vast majority of them are extremely small damage area. 
Um, there is some seasonal association with those. So the the, the drier the the fuel load, the more likely you are to have small fires that we are mobilised to respond to. Um, so we do see significant volatility in those figures. Um, so a 30% increase is of the usual order of fluctuations each year. Um, and if we look at the grassland statistics that we publish over a 10 year period, it, it is wildly different every year, uh, which makes it very difficult to draw associations. And I suspect that's why uh, my team would suggest that targets would, would not really um, be insightful. Um, sorry, Stuart, stepping on your toes a bit there. Not at all, Gregor, you answered it far, far better than I would have. So thank you. Well, please, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Teamwork. Um, Leslie, please. Thanks, Leslie Bloomer, board member. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Gregor. That was really helpful. And you've picked up a number of the questions that I had. So I'm just picking down the ones that remain. Uh, going back to page 29, um, and these are uh, indicator numbers 1.08 and 1.09. Um, and I was just wondering the difference between those PIs. Uh, one is excluding precautionary checks and the second is not. Can you just ex help me with that? <clears throat> uh, certainly. Um, when a casualty is recorded um, by officers at the scene, uh, they record the the severity of the injury. So if a casualty attends hospital or requires first aid treatment, those uh, interventions are recorded. Some subset of those category of casualties that we record um, have simply been advised to speak to their own GP and they've not received any first aid treatment at the scene or we have no evidence that they then go on to receive any treatment at all. So it's a, re a record of uh, the officer's concern for the individual. And so yeah. what we see is variation regionally as well as nationally year to, day, year to year. It's a more robust statistic for the excluding precautionary checks. Got you. OK, that's really helpful. Now, um, I, I was comparing and contrasting um, between the number of accidental fires and the fire casualties. So the number of accidental fires are kind of showing a slight decrease in the low and medium, but the number of fire casualties uh, by both measures is actually showing a hefty decrease. And I was just quite interested in that because clearly we want the number of fires to come down, but but even more so we want the number of casualties to come down. So I'm just wondering if we've got any any thoughts on, on, on why we've got that discrepancy between two indicators that you would expect to track each other. Um, so, so the picture up right there, Leslie, so the, the question is, why is the number of fire casualties falling quicker than the number of low and medium fires? Yes. Yeah, OK, so um, probably anecdotal. So but my suggestion would be that fires are being detected much earlier and, and, and due to the prevalence of detection within domestic premises and that thereby alerting people uh, before they become a casualty. So that would be my immediate response to that. However, there need to be a much more detailed analysis to, to fully ascertain why. Interesting, that's really helpful, Stuart. And that then would lead us to think, uh, your explanation sounds absolutely uh, uh, very, very plausible indeed, but that would lead us to think that with the new legislation coming into force now, then that trend will continue. That would be the assumption and, and the hope, yes. And in terms of the last year's fatal fire analysis, just for an example, um, still in 25% of cases where fire fatalities occur, um, there is no detection present. So clearly we want to close that gap. The more we close that gap, the more people will hopefully not succumb to fire uh, uh, within a domestic setting. So um, hopefully the new legislation will have brought that to the fore again and help, uh, as I say, close that gap. Great. Excuse me, could I just jump, Leslie, could I just jump in on that? Um, two things. One, Leslie, a great question. It, it was one I had there as well. But secondly, Stuart, could you just repeat what you just said there? Because I found that quite eye opening. Did you, what was the business around the fatalities and the lack of fire detection systems that you've just mentioned? Yeah, so and, and around about 25% of fire fatalities, there is no detection present within the, within the, the premise. So, on the, wow. in the premises, yeah. So. And that, that points up uh, the the need to really keep pushing at the vulnerable home fire safety visits, doesn't it? I, and the make the call and everything Absolutely. targets that group, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, can I move on, Nick? Yeah. Okay, moving to page 
30, uh, this is uh, fire safety audits. And in the little black and white box at the bottom right hand of the graph, we've got number of fire safety audits completed in accordance with fire safety enforcement framework. And the target is 100%. And the 0% means that we are just checking, we've hit the target. We're absolutely bang on the target. So we are indeed completing the audits for 100% of the framework premises. Is that, is that right? So I'm just trying to find that, please. If, if I, I think I can answer to that. Yeah. Um, that mm -hmm. is my understanding of what it means. The 0% is no change on the total. That target, I believe, is that we complete all statutory required um, audits and additional audits thereover are, are displayed, but not a part of the target. So uh, as I understand, it, it's 100% completion of statutory uh, enforcement requirements. Good. OK, excellent. That's great. Thanks for clar clarifying that. And that's that's uh, great to know. Um, and my last question was just you picked up a uh, Gregor on the, the big increase in effecting entry. And I just wondered, uh, Stuart, I guess if you had any thoughts as to why that was happening. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very simple, uh, Leslie. We're, we're receiving more calls from partners, primarily police and Scottish Ambulance Service to effect entry into premises. That has increased exponentially over the last few years and, 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 and the trend is continuing upwards. So um, yeah, it's just so that, that's the main factor. So it's just a continuing trend. And I mean, but, but we don't actually know why is it that they, that we, that we are so happy and smiley and come and do, do a, a good job and they know about us, or is it more cases uh, being required? So is it a greater awareness of police and ambulance as to what we can do, or is it a greater number of cases that they are responding to? Yeah, it's probably, it's probably a combination of both, Leslie, and it probably also reflects the pressures that pr primarily the Scottish Ambulance Service have been under for the last two plus years, um, and obviously the need for us to support that uh, and, and, and carry out that role. OK, that's lovely. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all. Um, Tim. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, this is just an, an addendum, an information piece for me on that last point around the affecting entry. And I, I, I'm surprised that it's ahead of dwelling fires. I mean, that's, <laughs> I think most people would be quite, quite taken aback by that. But are they blue light journeys, Stuart? Can, uh, are they blue light journeys? Um, the, so the, the, the subsets of affected entry, but primarily they are blue light journeys because inevitably it's because somebody is trapped within the premise, Tim, so they'd be classified as an emergency call. OK, that's that's very interesting. Thank you. But there are, sorry, just, just to, to, to add to that, there, there are affected entry calls that are not emergency response, i.e. somebody's locked themselves out of their premise or something like that as well, but they'll be included in there. Gregor can intervene if I'm, I'm, if I'm incorrect, but I'm sure they're included within that subset. Mm -hmm. OK, thank that you. That's my understanding. That's great. Thank you. Angelina. Thank you. So, um, Gregor, you rightly um, flagged that behind the response times sits, you know, lots of complexity, very multidimensional and so forth. Um, I get all that, nor do I want to dwell on it too much, given our earlier observations. Nonetheless, the creep upwards since 1718 is consistent and you know where a line graph it would be pretty unmissable and i know we're getting to ufas implementation later in our agenda but my question relates to the relationship between ufas and response times and forgive me i have no doubt we've been told this more than once already i give myself new point for recall at this point but could you remind me, please, Stuart, what is the anticipated impact of our preferred UFAS model on capacity and therefore response times? And do we think it's going to be enough to reverse that consistent upwards trend? Do you see my question? I, I do indeed. Um, so can I just ask somebody to do it? Just getting feedback there. OK, so it's quite complex. So the, the, the overall intent from the, the, the preferred option for UFAS is to reduce um, UFAS calls by around about 57%. However, because of the, the level of call challenge that will go in beyond currently what we do, we do do call challenge at the moment, but it probably go beyond that 
there will be potentially an increase in call handling times. So there's three elements to the, uh, to, to the, the, the response times. There's call handling, there's a the time to mobilise and there's a the time to attend. So the call handling times will inevitably go up because more questions and engagement will take place between the, um, the operator and the premise and or the alarm receiving centre that, that takes place. So I anticipate that we will see a keep up in terms of that. I'm content that that will be acceptable. Um, but we'll obviously continue to monitor it and without going into too much detail in terms of some of the work that Scott's doing in terms of the UFAS project, that will be part of the measures that we look at in terms of evaluating the impact of the UFAS policy. But as you rightly say, there's a myriad of other factors that contribute to response times, you know, 20 mile an hour zones within built up areas, you know, changes to, to legislation in terms of uh, uh, road risk, seatbelts, pre-dressing, all these things all continue to, to, to factor within, within response time. So it's, it's hard to distill that down into separate elements. However, as Gregor um, highlighted, that work is ongoing at the moment and will come to my continuous improvement forum in, in March to, to look at that in a more granular detail. Does that answer your question on the UFAST part, Angela? So, yes. I, what the words I'm struggling to get here, I, I completely understand it's not wise to make this more scientific than it can be given the multiplicity of factors. It had run in my mind that we had a quantified link at some point with, with a number attached that, you know, with all a ton of caveats, but nonetheless that we had some um, projected Direct impact. Am I wrong in thinking that? Yeah, I think so right, perhaps. Okay, what, fair enough. Yeah, I, there was never a quantifiable number put on in terms of impact of response times. There was a reduction in blue light journeys, which might be perhaps ah, right, one okay. one So blue light journeys would come down because we don't send as many appliances. So that might be the, the factor right. that we were okay. referring thank to. You. The, the response right, times are okay, perfect. My error, and thank you therefore for clarifying that, Stuart. Thank you. No, oh, thanks to both. And uh, can I ask uh, just a couple of questions uh, addressed either to Stuart or to Gregor? Um, I'm going to ask a daft laddie question. Vehicle fires. Are we talking about fires that are deliberately vehicles are set alight or are we talking about I'm driving down the road and my battery explodes and the car set is, is on fire just as a matter of interest? Yeah, both. I think is the, 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 the easy answer, Nick. There is, again, okay. there is again subsets of vehicle fires within the incident recording system. But Gregor, please keep me right. I think that vehicle fire statistic that you're looking at is the combination of deliberate and accidental. Precisely, yes. OK, great. Thank you. Um, can I ask, I'm going to just further ask a question that Leslie brought up earlier about 1.08 and 1.09 on page 29 of the whole meeting pack. Um, and it's around number of fire casualties, brackets, excluding precautionary checks, and then the number of fire casualties. If a precautionary check is, I walk out of my house fire and I sort of cough a little bit as I go out and somebody says to me, excuse me, I think you better, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with you. I think you better go and see a GP if you feel unwell. Is that a useful statistic at all? Do, do, does anybody use that? Do, do, or, or do you? Do, or does the service record that purely to say that um, I advised Mr. Barr when he walked out that he should see a GP? In other words, to just cover ourselves a little bit to make sure that people understand the importance of getting checked if they don't feel well. Because it would strike me that of, of interest to the service and to us is 108, which is the number of fire casualties, excluding the precautionary checks. Does that make sense? Yes, Gregor, is there anything you want to add in terms of the statistical elements of that? I can certainly suggest where the value for precautionary check data would, would lie. I'd, I'd suggest if we were to have um, ambitions on the number of fire casualties we would be looking predominantly at at those who are not precautionary checks those who uh, who have who've definitely suffered an injury but it's worth noting that if someone at the scene refuses support from the firefighters then that would be considered precautionary check 
because we didn't give them first aid, but they could still be a casualty. So that data is valuable to the service, especially okay. for projects like the service delivery model program. Um, so we hold it and we publish it. Um, but I would always look to the non precautionary check data. No, that's a, a very valid answer, and it shows my ignorance really about the the um, the way in which the data is is used within the service. So um, uh, thank you. And could I know it's early days, and again, this has been brought up earlier. Um, we're obviously got the new legislation started at the beginning of this month. Has any thought been given to how, when we do home fire safety visits, we record? The, the number of times we're seeing the new types of alarms fitted. I, in other words, I could imagine in a year, two years, five years from now, somebody's going to say, what do we feel is the percentage uptake? And the only subject matter experts that ever enter anybody's houses are um, firefighters. Therefore, are, are, is there any thought given to recording what we're seeing out there? Um, but the trouble is, I suppose we'd have to have recorded what we didn't see before. Or I, I don't, I'm not sure. Any thoughts on that? There is a there is a field within the home fire safety visit um, the checklist for one of better term that records as a detection present when we when we first attend. So we would record that there's detection present. Um, however, the current system that we have in place um, due to ICT technical issues with it, we can't change it. So we can't now upgrade it to say what type of detection was present. Was it pre 2022 detection or was it post? Um, however, the new um, system for safe and well visits does allow us to record things like that. So once we transition to that, Nick, we will be able to do that. But as things stand at the moment, we can only record if detection was present before the visit, if that makes sense. OK, um, it, it does make sense. And it, it's a shame that we, we were not agile enough to be able to jump, isn't it, to to say, OK, as we're, as the registration now started a few weeks ago, um, what what are we seeing out there? Because obviously we'll want to know some analysis on what effect that has had um, yeah. as, as we move forward. Yeah. Perhaps just to follow on from that, uh, another restriction that we can't currently have in place is the incident recording system that we use, the Home Office based IRS system, doesn't allow us to make any changes. And it's also um, quite restrictive in terms of the drop down menus. So again, we can record if detection was present, but not the type um, to, to reflect the new type. That said, if it's a significant casualty or fatality, the fire investigation team will note the type of detection that was present um, in a very detailed way, and um, so we can record it through that uh, through that mechanism. It's not ideal, but it provides some some level of, of detail. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And finally, um, from me, um, we had colleagues will be aware we had a workshop recently. And we looked at the way in which we interpret performance data. One of which it was a very interesting uh, conversation, and one I, I don't want to lose what we had there. And the, one of the the strands of thought that came out there is a further analysis on home fire safety visits, in particular the deep dive around how we're targeting our visits, what information are we using, our effectiveness. Uh, Leslie also brought in a number of different aspects around uh, diversity and uh, ethnicity and also uh, around value for money and just about what how, how much bang for buck we're getting. I'd like to carry on developing that a bit further, but I feel it's probably unfair to do that if Chris and Richard aren't here right now at this moment. Um, so Stuart, uh, perhaps we we could follow that on uh, with I know you're in agreement because I know we talked about this before, but I, perhaps we could follow that on post meeting with a, an email trail that could perhaps uh, scope out and flesh out a, a further deep dive that would then explore that in a little further detail. Do you have any points to make on that? No, the only point I'd make is I, I agree entirely. I think that this, we've already kicked off quite a considerable amount of work within the service delivery to, to start to look at that and to identify some of the points that you, you, you've raised. So more than happy to, to, to explore that further off the table. Excellent. OK, thank you. Well, in that case, then, Debbie, I'd like to take an action that the and the action will be. If you can even put an action on me to 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 write to Stuart and 
to start that discussion around a further deep dive into home fire safety visits. Hopefully to, to pull out some of the strands that you're already working on, Stuart, rather than to create any additional work. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, Gregor, thank you very much. That's uh, excellent. Uh, really, really good. And, and as you can see, um, um, we're very interested in the work that you you and, uh, and Chris and the team produce. So um, thanks once again, and thanks for stepping in a short notice. That was excellent. Can I now move us on to the item of um, 8.2? Now, whilst I say I'll move us on, we're actually going to defer this because Richard will join us further on. So item 8.2, could Ali just remind me that we'll bring that in at the end of the meeting, please? Which then brings us to 8.3 and back to Stuart now for an update on the development of the work plan to implement the preferred UFAS response option. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, at this point, I'll introduce um, Scott Simon as well. Um, Scott is the new project lead for, for the UFAS work uh, and it's replacing uh, Ron, uh, Roy Dunsire. Um, so I'll take this opportunity, please, just to place on record my thanks to Roy for the incredible work that he'd done uh, in terms of his project. Uh, he heads off now into retirement and, and is ably replaced by, by Scott. And, and Scott's got big shoes to fill, but he's more than, more than capable of doing that. And, and hopefully the, the committee also uh, join me in wishing uh, Roy well in terms of his retirement. So in terms of the specific piece of work in terms of UFAS, um, following the decision that was obviously made by the board in December in relation to the preferred UFAS response uh, model, the project team led by Scott have now developed the plan to support the implementation uh, of that preferred option. And now this takes full account of the feedback from the consultation process, but also the feedback from board members during that session. And um, the action plan is provided within the paper pack uh, for the committee's awareness. And um, there's six key work streams within it. Um, the first one is around the policy and procedural development uh, and the government of such. Uh, the second relates to the monitoring and evaluation and the point that uh, speaks to the, the, the point that Angelina made earlier about how we capture the benefits, the impact, both positively and potentially uh, otherwise in terms of the UFAS introduction. Um, comprehensive stakeholder comms and engagement strategy, uh, and clearly this is a key area that we should need to ensure that duty holders are adequately prepared for the new uh, process to come into place, uh, that staff awareness is raised and that the, the issue relating to the, the RVDS uh, is appropriately uh, considered and managed. Um, the development of the training programmes, both for frontline staff and for operational uh, control staff, um, the command and control system configuration work, which will need to be done to support the UFAS implementation, uh, and lastly, the engagement um, and agreements with uh, alarm receiving centres uh, and how they communicate with our, our operational control rooms. Again, this is a hugely important element of the UFAS work and, and was discussed in detail uh, with the board through the various uh, sessions. So um, I really welcome the, the committee's views on the action plan as presented uh, and whether we'd like to see this on forthcoming uh, SDC agendas in order to monitor progress and indeed see some of the outputs uh, as they're developed by Scott and the team and particularly in relation to stakeholder uh, engagement. So uh, I, I shall pause at that and I'm happy to take any questions uh, along with uh, Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, welcome, Scott. And also, I'd like to pass on behalf of uh, the committee our thanks to Roy for his previous work. That's excellent indeed. Uh, so, welcome, Scott. Um, I'm sure you will look forward to our meetings with delight. Uh, Malcolm. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, and uh, again, good to see this moving forward. I just want one of the the things you mentioned. Uh, Stuart was the the benefits and how we're going to monitor that going forward, uh, but obviously in, in the the appendix at the moment we're mainly looking at action sort of thing. So you know you, you reference if you want to reference five thirteen two the benefits were communi communicated provide the foundation of performance measures. So I'm just um, you know what route is that going to go through? How are we going to see these benefits in a sense as they uh, are realised? Yeah, so that's obviously the work that's getting developed at the moment by, by Scott and the team, and, and clearly the, the direction of those taken, the governments that, that look into those benefits will need to be determined through that process as well. Uh, Malcolm, but I suggest it's probably something that would feature on forthcoming performance management frameworks, 
in terms of impact of the UFAS policies. So, Scott, is there anything you maybe want to add to that or content? No, I think you've covered that quite well, Stuart, and, and thanks everyone for the, the welcome into the meeting. Um, it is something we're developing just now. We have had early meetings with uh, performance and data services to look at what our performance measures are likely to be, and we're conscious that that's probably one of the work streams that the, the board and the service delivery committee will be most interested in to see the, the benefits um, as anticipated against the, the consultation um, that were articulated through the consultation process. So yeah, it will go through the appropriate governance routes, but I would expect it to be a, a to feature highly within both this meeting group and uh, the performance framework as well. well that, that's great, thanks. Look forward to that. Cheers. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Thanks, Nick and, Nick and hi, uh, Scott. Good to have you on board. Um, great to see this coming together. Um, I've got a sequencing question. I, I wasn't, I couldn't quite get my head round how we can be preparing all the different stakeholders for implementation. So that's task three. How we can do that in advance of uh, reviewing and revising the policy. Um, can you help me with that one, please? Scott, do you want to pick up or do you want me to? Yeah, that, that can come in there. Um, I don't necessarily see that as a as a sequential um, item or a sequential part of that. Um, the policy will be more about our internal, how we a concept of operations to how we call handle to how we mobilize to, to what we do when we're in attendance to, to what we do post incident as far as engagement with duty holders goes uh, and that also includes engagement with premises where we don't necessarily attend anymore but we're still conscious that they are still suffering from high incidence of um, automatic fire alarms and um, the, the engagement side is really more about the to best prepare the premises, the duty holders, the responsible persons out there for the, the change that's coming. Um, uh, and the, the policy will be more about the formal acknowledgement of how we respond rather than the, how duty holders are, ex are expected to, to prepare themselves for it. I, I don't know if that makes sense. I hope it does. I think so. Let me kind of just uh, reflect it back and see if I've got it right. So what you're saying is that we're currently clear on what we will be doing from the, for, for the outside stakeholders. Yeah, they, they will be clear, They are we are clear, and they will become clear as to what we're going to do and what's required of them. Yeah, yep. so the policy is how we manage the back, the back functions, the back office functions uh, within SFRS. Okay, and that's helpful. And there's an element in the UFAS policy which says potential engagement with key staff and stakeholders, and we're proposing a formal consultation process so is that just going to, yeah, you, so is that will be internal, that will not be a big external thing. Yeah, yeah. that's internal consultation process, the agreed 28 day process. Yeah, cool. OK, that's really helpful. Many thanks. OK, thank you. Um, thanks to all. Does anybody have any further questions about the UFAS update? No. OK, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. And we'll see you um, at the next meeting. Thank you. And thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Scott. That now takes us to item nine and the clinical governance framework and over to John. John. Thanks, Chair. Um, Chair, this the paper has been provided. It's, it's for information only. Um, it's just a, a just a, a further update on um, the clinical governance. The MOU is due to be signed next week by the, the Chief Officer um, and then subsequently by the, the, the Chief Exec. Um, the Clinical Governance Technical Working Group um, has already met it's had its inaugural meeting that was uh, last week um, and it went very well um, and it will continue to do the work. It's focusing on um, the report that was provided by the Scottish Ambulance Service and the bits that we're going to use moving forward as a service to improve the uh, response to um, clinical um, interventions that we do as a service. Um, there's not... As, as previously reported by Richie Hall, there's not a great gap that needs to be filled in what the Scottish Ambulance Scottish Ambulance's assessment was. Um, and that work's now going to continue between training and operations moving forward. And it was being agreed now that the clinical governance will form part of business as usual work between both directorates. 
Um, Chair, I'm happy to get any questions on it, but it's a it's a continues to be a work in progress and it's moving in the right direction. We've delivered what we said we would deliver um, as far as objectives are concerned between uh, myself and the area commander who's in charge of it. Um, that's it, Chair. Uh, thank you, John. Um, thank you, and, and thanks go to your team for the, all the work that's gone into this, because the, 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 there has been a fair bit, a chunk of work as we, um, and I could, could imagine engaging with the Scottish Ambulance Service over the last couple of years has been somewhat problematical in, ch in terms of pure uh, pressure that service is under, um, so uh, um, uh, very uh, hard work. Could uh, I've got a couple of questions, but before I say anything, uh, does anybody have any questions to John? No, okay. John, we talked about in the past um, that uh, alongside the MOU is the SLA. Is the w could you just give us an update of where we're up to with the service level agreement then between the two organisations? Yeah, um, my understanding it's completed as well, um, Nick. And and signed off and and. Uh, I'm not sure if it's been signed off yet because the, the MOU has not been signed off and that's just been that's been a clash of diaries. We're getting it done. We're doing it individually rather than doing it collectively at the moment. That's, there's just been a clash of diaries and unable to get uh, both chief chief officer and chief exec in this room at the same time. Sure. But the work, okay. the, the work on the SLA is definitely a, very much an advanced stage between, it, as you know, as well as with the MOU, it went back and forward to legals on a number of occasions. So, but it is absolutely, it's not hindering us in any way, shape, or form in the delivery of the uh, the work of the technical working group. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. And. We'd spoken in the early days of this of uh, of a perhaps an annual report that comes to the service delivery committee in terms of a summary of the year's progress that might have been an annual update that came out of uh, would it have been your operational clinical governance committee? It's a technical working group. That would be that, that's where that would come. And bear in mind that that reports to the SMB. There's that technical working group reports into ROC, uh, which sits under the deputy chief officer. It's a it's a separate group to the SMB, and that's where that report would go to. So, I would suggest if this group, if 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 you want is for that to come to this committee, we go through that governor's route first via via the DEP uh, through the SMB, and then on to this group for information. OK, OK. So, I mean, one of the reasons we've been having um, quarterly updates on this was just to keep us in tune with the progress you and the team have been making with this. And, it, and it's obviously moved on uh, considerably and it's been an excellent piece of work, as we said, in a difficult environment. I wonder whether or not, as we now seem to have be almost at the point at which we're reaching significant milestones, such as the MOU being signed off, the SLA being signed off, the uh, the clinical practice audit being completed, we could look towards um, ceasing update reports with regards to that early work, with the conclusion being noted by a report that gives, um, excuse me while I just gather my thoughts here, that, that gives basically a slice in time of, um, you know, as of the date, the MOU has been signed off, the SLA has been signed off, and then including that also a little organogram of uh, of which uh, the technical working group then reports into the uh, what did you say the SMB? That's correct. Um, and then and then how we could then reflect that in an organogram that says and and perhaps annually or whatever we decide, then that is also reported through. Uh, I don't know where it would go. Does it go via SLT then and possibly into the uh, into the service delivery committee for an annual report? In other words, what I'm saying is, c can we can we look to have some thoughts, please, about how we conclude the quarterly reports looking that's been looking in the work in progress on the development of the clinical governance structure and the clinical audit and then say that work is effectively being complete now it's, as you say, business as usual, and therefore this is the structure we've now established. Um, forgive me, Nick. I thought we had provided that at the last service delivery committee where Richie came along and said that we've completed that audit and we provided that that report. 
the MOU is getting signed. Um, I've got it marked down next week by the chief officer, and then it'll go to the chief exec. I think that sorry, the ambulance service chief exec already signed it off, so that will be completed. So it would just be the SLA. But I thought we'd already reported to this committee that the work that, we, that had already been done. So just for for clarity, are you wanting another report in the next service delivery committee that? Gives an over, a summary overview of that with an organogram of where the reporting line is. Um, effectively, yes. I'd like. Uh, I think we need to have a conclusion of the work that you've done now to say this is the summary of the work we've done. Here's, here's effectively, um, effectively the closing report of the establishment of all these groups, and also a statement that says that the MOU has been signed off, the SLA has been signed off, and this is the organogram. And then you can expect. The service delivery could then expect the next report, uh, or, or sorry, the, a, a, the first annual report perhaps um, that arises from the technical working group. Ross, did you want to um, come in on that, please? Thanks, Chair. It was just really to provide assurances regarding that escalation between SMB and the service delivery committee. Um, we don't have a separate executive board that deals with service delivery matters. So all of the service delivery matters come through SMB anyway, and we've got pretty tried and tested, you know, ways of escalating between SMB and the service delivery committee. So we can do anything that we need to to support that. And it may I mean, it might be worth an off table discussion, Chair, but it's maybe even something that we could incorporate into the SD update report that's coming forward. So rather than having a separate report, we can just integrate it with the existing business that we're bringing anyway. But there's no issues with escalating between SMB and Service Delivery Committee and happy to discuss what that looks and feels like going forward. Thanks. Excellent. OK, OK, let's do that then. Let's have that off table discussion and uh, perhaps you and I can pick that up in a week's time at our, um, our, our meeting. Um, thank you. And um, does anybody else have any questions before I move on? OK, thank you, John. Thank you. Let's move now to item uh, 9.2 and back to you, Stuart. Thanks, uh, Chair. So this presents the Grenfell uh, Action Plan update number 10. Um, a significant amount of progress has been made uh, since the last uh, service delivery committee in terms of the, the action plan. Key to this was the delivery of a series of training and uh, exercise and events which took place uh, in December uh, last year. Um, and those were to test our new procedures for, for high rises. And um, these were large scale exercises that took a, a, a huge number of resources, both in terms of operational control and uh, frontline uh, operational uh, resources. Um, some of the elements which we tested were around about move from state put to full evacuation, uh, handling a large number of fire survival guidance calls, uh, and transmission of information between OC and the, the fire ground. Um, following those practical exercises, we were able to close off seven actions, and, and these are set out within the paper. Um, this left one remaining action, and that relates to the management of fire survival guidance, should they, and I'm using the term, overspill between, uh, from SFRS to other UK fire and rescue service control rooms or the police and ambulance control room. Uh, within the paper, it did state that this was due for completion in February, and I'm pleased to say that that exercise took place last week uh, under the name Operation Willowbeck, uh, and that action has now been completed as well. So essentially, all the actions are now closed off in terms of the, of the plan. It's just a phasing issue in terms of when it came to the Service Delivery Committee. Um, the intent is then to bring a closing report to the next Service Delivery Committee, which sets out all the actions that have been put in place and, and the evidence links to support each of those. Uh, it's worth noting that the HMI thematic inspection of high rises remains ongoing, uh, and I note from the, the inspector's update that he's providing an update in his own report later. Uh, in terms of phase two, uh, I've provided some comment previously in terms of the focus and direction that this is taking, uh, and the service remain in close contact with partners, uh, including Scottish Government, on the progress of this. So needless to say, I think there'll be some significant and broad considerations for the UK Fire and Rescue Service as a whole, um, but also for SFRS uh, as part of that phase two recommendations. Um, I'll pause there, Chair, and happy to take any questions on the Grenfell uh, update. No, thank you. And again, this is a long-term uh, work in progress, and 
has been extensively reviewed by the committee. So um, thank you once again for your continued work with that. Leslie. Thanks, Stuart. And I know that this has been a priority for the service and it's really good to see it uh, coming uh, together. And I know that it's great that you've managed to get it to conclude all the uh, actions uh, despite the uh, all the COVID and other pressures that uh, that you've had to deal with. So I think it's great to see that. Um, my question is just a, about the OC staff. There's a comment made about OC staff at the incident ground being good practice. And I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about their role there and what that adds and how that might be incorporated into a routine practice. Thank you. Yeah, it's something that we've kind of aspired to do for, for a long time and even before before Glenfell, uh, Leslie, I think that the benefits of having OC staff on the control room really enhances that level of command and control that we can bring to this, the fire grounds. We have command and support units and, and control staff are, are excellent at communicating uh, and using all the systems we have in place. So I think that would enhance that communication between OC, the incident support rooms, which are based at OC, and having those staff on site to help manage the both access the systems so they can look at fire survival guidance and things like as they come out, but also have that that real um, dialogue and understanding. They are subject matter experts when it comes to all things communications and control. So why would we not use them on the fire ground to enhance what we've already got? You know, so I think it's it's a it's a real good way forward. You know, and as I say, something that we've aspired to do for a long time. And, and Libby and the team are working really hard to do that. Clearly, OCR we'll under a number of uh, challenges at the moment. Um, but as I say, we're, we're progressing that at pace. Excellent, thank you. And does anybody else have any questions? Um, Robert. You're on mute, Robert. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear you now. Sorry, the, um, Chair, just an observation more than a question actually and just for board members benefit I, I did have the luxury of attending the exercises that Stuart referred to uh, to observe as part of the thematic uh, and I would just like to uh, put on record my uh, recognition of the staff that attended and, and actually what was most pleasing because on both occasions I attended twice with a couple of months between them um, on both occasions, everyone, you know, performed to a high standard, but actually what was most pleasing was that the lessons that had been learned from the first exercise had indeed been implemented and the policies had been adapted by the time the second exercise uh, ran. Uh, and it was a significant improvement in the performance and the outcome as a result of that. So I think it just shows the benefit of having these exercises at a national level uh, and the training, you know, being played out in that practical arena. Uh, and it should be something that uh, the service uh, is recognised for. And I know board members didn't have the luxury of being there, so I thought I'd just bring it to your attention that from my perspective, it was uh, time well spent. No, thank you, Robert. And um, not only not only was um, is that a, a very useful observation, it just goes to show the uh, the value of having you on on, the, on as an attendee of the meeting that actually adds that different dimension of a different view in, into that, because obviously um, not only were we not there, but even if we have been there, we may not have been able to give it the uh, well, we wouldn't have been able to give it the analysis that you've given it. So thank you very much for that feedback. Very positive. Final opportunity for anybody else to say anything about Grenfell. No, OK, thank you. Um, let's move now then to item 10, climate change. Welcome back, Bruce. Some considerable time since you were here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair. And I won't make the same mistake twice. Stuart, do you want to introduce this, please? Thank you very much. I, I, I absolutely would. So thank you, uh, Chair. This, this is second in a series of papers and reports that discuss how we're responding to climate change and the climate emergency from an operational and service delivery perspective. So clearly last time we had flooding, this time is around about wildfires. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Bruce to the meeting. Uh, Bruce is an uh, in-house subject matter expert on all things wildfires um, and he also represents the service admirably in, in various forums across Europe and in the NFCC. Um, Bruce is also the architect of the wildfire strategy uh, which are kind of overviews provided within the paper uh, uh, as well. Uh, and Bruce is going to take us through the paper and, and between Bruce and I we will answer any subsequent questions on the paper. So without any further ado, I'll bring Bruce in. 
Thanks very much, Stuart, and good morning, Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, as Stuart said, I'll go through the paper. I don't intend to go through it in huge detail. I'll just pull out some salient points and then uh, answer any questions that may be put to me. Um, so uh, the risk of wildfire um, is ever ever steadily increasing, unfortunately. The impact of climate change um, is slowly but surely being seen, and we're, we're in the midst of a, a very mild winter, which means that all that heather and grass on the hills has been um, having a, a longer growing season, which means there's no fuel available. I tend to talk about fuel rather than vegetation, so the, the two phrases are interchangeable in this. Um, we've obviously also had some significant storms with another one forecast to hit us later today. And if you've been driving around the countryside, you'll have seen the devastating impact that's had on our, our forests. Um, that's going to compound the issue, unfortunately, because a lot of that um, windblown timber will be left to waste by the forestry um, operators because it's not financially viable to remove it. Um, so that's going to leave a large amount of drying flammable material that is um, obviously able to, to uh, fire, take a hold of it, but is a very, very difficult environment for firefighters to work in because of the underfoot conditions. And wildfire tends to have a, a six to nine-ish year cycle. Our last large year for wildfires was 2013, um, so we're, we're due for another large year of wildfire. Uh, so we add that to the mild winter and all this windblown material that's, uh, that's um, abundantly available around the country. We do have a risk that is increasing. So the strategy is um, it's multi-stranded. We've, we've got obviously a prevention initiative within there, but we have a response and a very strong partnership theme throughout both. Um, the prevention piece of work uh, is both internal to SFRS, but very strongly uh, aligned with our partners. And, and there was a piece of work initiated by um, Fergus Ewing uh, based upon actually the COVID um, impact when lockdown was, was removed and we saw large numbers of people who were unable to go abroad for a holiday, then having a staycation, um, the infrastructure was unable to support it. Um, we saw extreme behaviours by the public, uh, unfortunately, and as such a visitor management strategy was put in place um, with a, a number of different partners around the table, which, which actually served a fantastic purpose for us because we were able, able to bring the fire prevention initiative to the fore there and our, our agenda to get good quality communication to the public um, was able to be fastened onto that vehicle that had an awful lot of ministerial approval and resource put to it. So we saw some fantastic work happening all around the country, um, both by our partners and by our own staff to get good quality messages to the public, and that's something that will prevail. Um, our response strategy uh, in relation to what we're doing internally to SFRS, first of all, uh, we've identified where we want our different tiers of stations, our tier two, which is our welfare support stations, and our tier three, which is our welfare um, specialist stations. Uh, and we had a, a bit of challenge in that, uh, particularly with our tier two stations, uh, which predominantly are um, retained and volunteer stations. So the additional equipment they were going to be getting, um, we just couldn't um, safely and appropriately store that equipment on the locations. So the initial approach was to have the equipment stored on their vehicles. The vehicle's capacity was a challenge, so then it was to store it off the vehicle, but put on the vehicle when they get turned out to a wildfire. That was going to be a challenge as well. So we've had to go back to the drawing board with that and have a different approach, which is very much aligned to other approaches we take for specialisms, where equipment is delivered en masse in bulk by logistical support vehicles um, and then accessible by the specialist at the incident. Very similar to how we operate our USAR response, our phone response to any um, large scale phone incident. Uh, so not unfamiliar to us and certainly has benefits. Um, the process for procurement for our vehicles and equipment is well underway. Um, we have a UIG which has been in place for a number of months and our pr procurement colleagues are giving us fantastic support in relation to getting the uh, all of the various equipment and vehicles and, and, and indeed PPE that we need for our um, for our different tiered approach. 
We're also working with our partners. Um, any large wildfire, it would be entirely wrong to think that it's just the fire service that deal with it. Um, the rural community supports us immeasurably at these incidents, and we want to make sure that that can not only continue, but can be done in a more coordinated and, dare I say, it, safer manner, um, because the, the gamekeepers predominantly really want to come along and help us but we need we as the um, legitimate health and safety authority at that incident, the people with overall responsibility for everybody's well-being, have to assure ourselves that they are correctly trained, correctly equipped, and can be used in a, a, a much more supportive way than perhaps we have done previously. So there's some really good work on the go with that, which builds upon a piece of work which I'll cover in just a second. So our internal um, strategy Deployment is going well um, with every project, as you know, whenever there's uh, equipment and vehicles required, it seems to take quite a long time to get things moving, but that doesn't mean there's not a huge amount of effort going on in the background. And we are at the point where we'll begin to see some real significant um, changes happening in the not too distant future. We've done a lot of communication with the stations that are going to be impacted, a lot of engagement with them, which has in some occasions meant that we've had to go and say we want to come and put our, our resource at your station and then go back and say actually we can't do that because of the, the challenges of logistics and then go back to them a third time and say actually we've rethought our approach and we are going to still be using you just in a different way um so we've had that mixed reaction from particularly our community response units in the highland area and i have to say they've been nothing but supportive in the the, uh, the way they've dealt with the information so um I'll cover the work we're doing in partnership because this is actually where there's been probably the most work and the and the biggest impact. Um, there's been a number of pieces of work carried out by government to review how uh, the particularly sporting estates are managed. And there's a report carried out that's uh, commonly called the Werity Report, and it gave a recommendation that anybody who uses muir burn, which is the practice of burning. Um, heather and or grass, or indeed any vegetation for land management purposes, should be licensed and better regulated. So the licensed providers in Scotland are Nature Scott, um, formerly known as um, the Scottish Natural Heritage. We're working very closely with Nature Scott and the Scottish Gamekeepers Association to develop a muir burn training package. And, and this is um, uh, this is unique. It's not happened before in the UK um, where gamekeepers would be given this level of training that's been created by um, someone other than themselves. Uh, and I have to say the gamekeepers are hugely supportive of this because they feel they've been vilified in the past by the number of fires that have happened in the countryside when actually you'll struggle to find a group of people who are more passionate about the welfare of the environment and the landscape because not only do they live and work in it, they, they derive their livelihood from it and they are extremely knowledgeable and passionate about it. So we have developed a muir burn training package. We're in the very final stages of uh, beta testing that. We've actually done one live demonstration of that already um, with more to come. And that's receiving extremely positive uh, interest from a number of parties, um, including, much to my surprise, and, and um, a little bit of fear, to be honest, uh, by the Prince of Wales, who has asked for a face-to-face, -face, one on one briefing with myself in April. Uh, and a demonstration to be carried out subsequently at Balmoral, um, so that there's no pressure associated with that, obviously. Um, but if we get um, royal approval to that piece of work, the, the the impact that I'll have with the rest of the community will be immeasurable. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we've carried out a number of pieces of research with our colleagues, uh, predominantly the James Hutton Institute, but also with the University of Manchester and the Leverhulme Institute, which uh, is an offshoot of um, University College in London, um, to look at a number of pieces of work. The main one being a fire danger rating for Scotland. So the one we use at the moment to produce our fire danger assessments is based upon a Canadian system um, and the the bulk of the work that was done and research that was done to create that was carried out on fuel types that are found in Canada. Um, now, obviously, we have different fuel types in Scotland, so while the Canadian welfare uh, danger rating system is useful, it is not entirely accurate. So we've done um, a couple of projects, uh, in well, one in Scotland, one across the whole UK, uh, to the tune of about £5.5 million worth of uh, support 
provided by both Scottish Government and um, the Nat Natural Environment Research Committee in England. Um, and, and the Scottish one is now complete and the UK one is underway, being led by the Manchester University team. Um, I'll probably pause there, to be honest. There's a lot of information in that. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there and just take any questions that you might have about the report or indeed anything to do with welfare. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Indeed. Uh, fascinating report. Fascinating topic, isn't it? Um, it the We first, I just look back quickly at uh, the history of, um, of of guest speakers at our meeting. You first were here in June 2019 and um, you, your work then um, when you presented uh, on wildfires was, uh, was uh, extremely interesting and you've obviously gone on to develop it and things have moved on in, in just a brief three years as well. So uh, well done to you and your team and and all the work that you, you're doing and i know i know this is a, a has been a particular pet project of yours so um well done thank you and there's also a very interesting article on the bbc news this morning as well um all about the global uh, uh, issues around wildfires um, again fascinating and uh, one of the things that i want to pick up in due course but i'll let others ask their questions first is the whole um phenomenal amount of carbon that's released and and, and the statistics that you produce in yours and that BBC article are, are just mind boggling in, in terms of the amount of, uh, of release of carbon. Uh, it's carbon dioxide, isn't it? Um, into the air. Yeah, phenomenal. Um, so thank you, Leslie. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, great to um, see you again and uh, I look forward to next time you're appearing, you'll have a royal appointment above your head in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the video slot. Uh, and good luck with the, the session with the, the Prince of Wales at Balmoral. Um, I, I've got some, a couple of kind of questions and then just a bit of a, a bit of, a bit of thought really. Um, the first question is that I, I vividly recall when you last spoke to us and you were telling us about the one of the largest fires that we'd had in Scotland, which had released approximately double the country's annual carbon release. Now, at the time, I had taken that to be Scotland's annual carbon release. In the paper, it says the UK's. Which was it? It's the UK's carbon release. That's I, fine. The, the bulk of that carbon release actually came from windblown trees rather than peat. So if you go back to what I just said a few moments ago about windblown trees and the, the impact that it's going to have, we, we could again see if we, if we get fires that um, involve windblow, then yeah, we, we could be in a very similar situation. Yeah. And you spoke a couple of times about the, the, the cyclical pattern every six to nine years. What lies behind that uh, cyclical pattern? And is that a reliable kind of trend to look forward? Um, so we, we've probably not got long enough today to fully cover the, the causation behind that cyclical because it's to do with um, global weather conditions, fuel growth patterns um, uh, and a number of other related issues. Uh, but there is a reliable trend. Six to nine years, I mean, it, it's broad brush, but we can look back over history and see that roughly six to nine years we see a peak in the number of fires that we have and in 2012 2013 just as the, the scottish fire and rescue service was being created and um, we had a, a hugely challenging year particularly in the highlands um, and it received an awful lot of publicity and, and unfortunately um, wildfire strategies tend to follow that cyclical approach and the interest that's given to them um, so we've done particularly well in SFRS to make sure that that, uh, that approach has, has been levelled out and we've got a continuing interest in developing our welfare strategy. But we can look back with some reliability, Leslie, to that cyclical pattern. OK, and it's kind of like the El Nino thing that you get. Uh, yeah, so that is, you know, it's just the way the earth works. OK, um, next, next kind of point is really about the ability of uh, the Scottish Fire Service to um, support other fire services uh, in Europe and around the world because the climate change is often seen as a as a as a steady run, but uh, the impact of wildfires to me uh, really uh, raises the the risk of uh, tipping points because if you have an increase in wildfires, 
you not only uh, emit tons of carbon, you also reduce the amount of uh, vegetation available to take in carbon. So it seems to me that the we're we're to coin a phrase where the earth is absolutely playing with fire if we don't get wildfires under under control. And um, so is, what might your aspirations or hopes be uh, as regards the Scottish Fire Service's ability to influence and support a uh, wildfire management uh, beyond Scotland? Thanks, Leslie. Um, it's a really, really good question, uh, and it's something that we've been involved in um, in the last couple of years and, and beyond, to be honest. So first of all, we, we have a very, very good relationship with an organisation called the Pau Costa Foundation. Um, they're an offshoot of the Catalonian Fire Service and are seen as the European leaders when it comes to both wildfire development training, but also fire analysis. And there, as a man there that leads the um, the Catalonian wildfire specialist group called Mark Castelnau, who we've fostered very good relationships with and have done a number of training courses with. Uh, and in fact, he was across here for the Scottish Wildfire Forum Conference um, in 2018 in Edinburgh. Um, so we are well established in Europe. We've also been part of a European consortium, um, a project into the Horizon 2020 banner um, to it was mainly to look at a wildfire prediction and management system um, and flooding and landslip, it was natural events, but also served to further develop relationships and networks with other European countries who have a similar problem. Um, and, and we were approached when Greece was having its wildfires last year, um, the UK was approached to see how we could support Greece in their efforts. Um, now, we have within the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service the International Search and Rescue Team, ISAR, um, which by happy coincidence I oversee. Um, and we have deployed ISAR predominantly to earthquakes in the past, and we ha um, have done that with huge success. And, and uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of, aware of Gary Carroll with Mac and Diesel, these two dogs. Um, he's part of the ISAR team. So NFCC and ISAR are working closely just now to see if we can include a wildfire capability in that because the ask that was made last year was a little bit ad hoc. It came um, from a very good place and we were very keen to support it, but we were going to be deploying our wildfire tactical advisors in a way they'd never been used before. So um, Scotland did consider and did stand ready to deploy a team. Um, however, the, uh, the team that was deployed was mainly from um, South Wales and Northumberland, who are our other comparators in the UK when it comes to welfare. They are the other two fire and rescue services that really are pushing on at pace. Um, so the NFCC work is now to see how our, our wildfire response can be aligned to our ISAR response, um, because there's all sorts of uh, governmental requirements um, to make sure they can be self-sufficient for two weeks, uh, that they've got all the documentation and inoculations in place should they be deployed anywhere, uh, and also they are equipped appropriately with the right PPE and, and, and so on and so on. So that's underway as well. So that, that's a very long way of saying that we have really good relationships. Um, we have a framework that we can build upon to both provide and receive support from other colleagues in Europe. And we have a relationship that we will actually be using as part of our training framework um, for our tactical burn teams um, from the Pau Costa Foundation in Catalonia. Uh, that's all uh, great and I very, very, very much support uh, uh, us supporting what we can with uh, fire services uh, beyond uh, Scotland, UK and uh, indeed Europe. Uh, my last uh, question is really around the communication um, and uh, I really welcome uh, the move to develop the, the great fire risk uh, system in, in Scotland and communication around that. Um, how will we uh, judge whether the communication has been effective? Um, any thoughts? In, in relation to the fire danger assessment? Uh, in relation to stopping people lighting fires. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, there'll be a clear indicator if we have less fires, then we, we, can, we can take that as a success factor. But um, we're actually... So this is under the banner of the Scottish Welfare Forum. Um, we're actually taking events out into the localities. So we, we have some different audiences when we're trying to give welfare prevention messages, and we have to make sure the information we give to those different audiences is tailored and specific to their needs. So we've got farmers and crofters, um, 
gamekeepers, the public, uh, people who live in those communities. Um, so we've got very different messages for everybody. So the the, the Scottish Welfare Forum is um, absolutely best place to make sure that the messaging that goes out across all the different groups and and, um, and audiences is supportive, consistent, not at odds. So there are, believe it or not, there are some messages out there that are at our that are at odds with each other. That wasn't easy for me to say, but I got there. Um, so the National Outdoor Access Code says that you um, can have a fire on a beach beside a loch, for example. But then the message that was put out last year by some uh, some councils was no fires anywhere. So immediately you've got that conflict. So the Welfare Forum is hoping to, no, not hoping, it is coming in there to make sure that messaging is consistent and supportive. And we'll measure success by how well received that information is when we go out and ask those questions at those events that we're taking out into the communities. So we're actually going to do a little bit of a self audit about how our messaging is being received. Um, because we can transmit as much as we want, but unless we actually understand what the recipient is hearing when we're transmitting, we don't know how successful that message is being. Uh, and we know there are some hard to reach audiences out there. I've mentioned crofters already. The crofters have a very different use of fire to the gamekeepers, for example, which is why the gamekeepers feel, feel vilified when, uh, when there's large fires on the west coast of Scotland where there are no sporting estates. So, you know, um, we're making sure that our messaging is appropriate and is effective um, by that self audit through the welfare forum. Okay, and I, I welcome the the uh, self audit uh, because yes, the absolute measure will be the number of uh, fires uh, being lit, but that's that's the, the lag measure and any lead measures that we can get uh, to help us tweak and tone the messaging to uh, so it's effective, particularly with the, the holiday makers, because they'll be incredibly hard to get to, incredibly hard to get to. I think so uh, work on the lead indicators uh, would be good. And uh, I welcome hearing more at an appropriate time. Thanks ever so much again, Bruce. That was great. Thank you. Uh, thanks to both. And uh, Stuart, you did have your hand up early on in that, uh, that, that discussion. Do you want to add anything just now? No, Bruce went on to cover exactly what I was going to, to cover, Nick, in terms of the relationship with NFCC and the development of our international support group, whatever it may be, and we follow to. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Tim, then Angelina. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and just a word of caution for you, I'd be very careful about anything you see on the BBC about climate change, or indeed on Sky for that matter. However, that aside, Bruce, this is a terrific uh, piece of work. Thanks very much for that, and builds on what you shared with us uh, when you presented to us uh, uh, a couple of years ago. I've got a question around the licensing regime. Uh, you uh, very uh, sensibly pointed out that the Werity report was a little contentious, uh, so we'll, we'll tiptoe around it a little bit. Um, the, so in order to be licensed, one has to undergo training, is, is the word you, is it exclusively our training or are, are there other providers that are available to deliver it? And, and when does the licensing regime kick in? Uh, and, and based on your, I know I'm running two or three questions together, but they're all linked. Um, Based on your engagement with stakeholders in this space, um, do you think that the licensing regime will uh, reduce the amount of muir burn or increase it or change it in any way, given that we think muir burn is such an important mitigating factor in, in managing um, wider fires? So, so th three things there. When's, is it just our training? Uh, when's the licensing kick in and what effect do you think it will have? Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, at, at the moment, yes, it is just our training. Um, so al although the training we've developed, as I said earlier on, is unique, it's never been done before. Um, because we've spoken about it a lot with other agencies and because we have discussed it with colleagues at NFCC, um, there is now a similar but significantly different piece of work that's been developed by um, the Forestry Commission Research Department, which is based down in England. So Forestry Commission doesn't actually exist in Scotland anymore. It's now um, Forest and Land Scotland and Scottish Forestry. Um, but in, uh, at a UK level, you still have the research section of the uh, Forestry Commission. It's hard to say branch when you talk about the Forestry Commission, but I'll try not to um, for the obvious pun. 
So the the fact that Nature Scott have been involved in developing the training has allowed us to build the training around the requirements that they are going to put in place or would seek to have in place for the Muirburn license. So at this point in time, because of the distinct differences between what's been developed in, in England and Wales and what's been developed in Scotland, it is only the training package that has been developed in conjunction with the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, Scottish Fan Rescue Service and Nature Scott that will be the only training package. We haven't got a deliverer for that training yet, so we're using an organisation called Lantra, which is a, um, it's like a SQA, but for rural uh, courses. Um, so we're getting accredited with Lantra um, and we're just about there with that. Um, and what they have said is one organisation should own the training, but they don't have to deliver it. They would then just identify Lantra accredited trainers who could then deliver that training. Um, so that's the process we're actually in the middle of right now. Uh, there are very few people who have the requisite skills to, to deliver a Muirburn training package because it is such a, a risk critical thing. If you get it wrong, then potentially you could be doing exactly the opposite of what you're seeking to prevent. Um, so that, that's the piece of work we're in place with just now. I've spoken at length with the, the lady who's actually looking after the license requirements um, for Muirburn and it isn't going to be put in place immediately. There's going to be a, a period of time where it will be a recommendation that people do the training. Then it will be a requirement but with no punitive action taken if you burn without it, just some corrective action taken. And then there'll be a hard line that from now on, if you burn without this, then action will be taken so that we give the landowners an opportunity to, um, to get that in place. I don't think we'll see any impact in the instance of Muirburn because the um, the practitioners of that at the moment, certainly in the sporting estates, are actually champing at the bit to get the training in place. They really do want it uh, and uh, are keen to see it because it will allow them to demonstrate that they really do want to abide by all the rules and make sure thing is as it should be. Um, the hard to reach communities are where uh, we really need to see an improvement in practice. So if we look at the gamekeepers and the, their practice of Muirburn, we've actually done a bit of research um, on our instant uh, recording system data and less than 3% of wildfires are caused by people doing what we would call through Muirburn. However, we then look at our crofting community, a large number of fires are, are, are caused by crofters because they have a different use of fire and a different end result they're seeking to achieve. Um, so that's the community we really need to get to and, uh, and improve practice. And it's very much from that point of view, we want to improve their practice, not stop them doing it because we won't stop them doing it. So if they're going to do it, let's help them to do it better and safer uh, and, and you know, make sure that we understand their needs and not just impose a set of rules upon them. So I think that's answered all three points. Tim, if it hasn't, please come back and ask me again. No, that was very comprehensive, Bruce. I appreciate it because I, I, you know, I, I know through um, personal contacts, it was a reduction in burning in Australia and New Zealand that has caused some significant problems. So anything that was going to um, uh, have the same sort of impact here would concern me. But it sounds like things are are being well managed. So uh, good to hear. Thanks very much for that. That was a great update. Thank you. One thing I would ask, Adam, I could chair is. Um, the Cairngorm National Park Authority have always been resistant to, to prescribe burning, not, not necessarily muir burn, but prescribe burning in their um, in their boundaries. Um, but they have now come to us on the back of us doing this training and going out and engaging with people about it. They've come to us and asked how we could help them to build a prescribed burning plan. So actually we're seeing an increase in the instance of muir burn or prescribed burning. Um, and their reason for doing it is not for sporting reasons, it's to uh, that have been very overt about it is to mitigate wildfire. So that's a huge success, a, a U-turn from the Cairngorm National Park Authority, but a huge success factor from my perspective. That, that, that's interesting to hear given, I mean, I wonder if Cairngorms run a very interesting youth engagement scheme through Minecraft. Um, so I'm wondering if that might be something that could be built into the Minecraft functionality to uh, do some controlled burning in a Minecraft uh, world. Uh, so, so you're building awareness amongst young people about the importance of it. 
So, uh, outside of my specialisation, I'm afraid uh, Minecraft. Uh, I'm <laughs> sure my kids would have to understand That's that. Okay. <laughs> they, they say board uh, members bring diverse thoughts. Well, that's uh, there's an example. Um, I, I think there are two people. Apologies, Angelina. I think there are two people who want to come into that. I'll go to Robert first, then Leslie. Um, Robert. Sorry, I actually didn't need to jump the queue on, on that one. It's it's just an observation. Um, I've still got very vivid memories of the 2013 wildfire season. Uh, Bruce and, and you and I were both in the north at that time and, and remember it well. Um, it's just a heads up, and I'm conscious that Bruce might not be staying for the rest of the meeting, but it's just a heads up for him that uh, within our next annual inspection plan for 22-23, we plan on carrying out a thematic on the operational implications of climate change. Uh, and Bruce, I see you playing a big part in that. So expect a phone call <laughs> from Rick Taylor, who's online at the moment, and, and Rick and I have been exchanging text messages on the on the side here to say that we'll, we'll need to tap into your experience, Bruce. So don't plan on retiring or leaving anytime soon, because we need you for the next year. Thanks, Robert. I might be on holiday that week, but I'll, uh, I'll mention it on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. And uh, to Leslie, on this point, is it? It, it is very, very briefly, um, just to declare an, an, an interest that has arisen. I have a, a close family member who works for Cairngorm National Park Authority. So just to declare that, no conflict of interest uh, at yeah. all, just to declare it. Thank you. OK, noted. Thank you. And Angelina. Thanks. So not questions, Bruce, just a couple of observations and a couple of very tentative suggestions to be sort of taken away and thought about more carefully. Um, but firstly, thank you for at the outset of your comments. You clarified a point I had, which was the use of the term fuel, um, which otherwise had me scratching my head a wee bit. So, um, so that you're not the only person to have made an unforgivable pun this morning. I will start by saying thank you for helping me to twig to what you were meaning, uh, sorry folks, um, in, in that way. Um, more seriously, because I hadn't had the benefit of the 2019 um, presentation and material, I found this report an absolute education at so many levels because my you know, bloody level of ignorance as I was reading it at the beginning anyway was, was really quite stark. So it was a, an excellent report also an alarming report in what it um, informed me about. So just to say thank you as a piece of written communication, um, extremely effective. Um, beyond that though, I, as a consequence of a couple of other SFRS meetings, I found myself thinking about our financial problems uh, particularly when we project, you know, future anticipated uh, mean settlements over the next few years. And I have found myself wondering whether there might be mileage in becoming a little more um, selective in the areas of our work that we think are, um, you know, demonstrably um, sort of urgent and growing and consuming resource, which also from a political, small p and large p in truth, perspective, are harder for government to push back on, if you see what I mean. And it strikes me that this area um, may be one such, if you see what I'm trying to flag here, because um, both from the Scottish government's own sort of you know, big ticket policy position around uh, the importance of the countryside and all that kind of stuff, but also um, climate change, not to mention its relationship with the Green Party. So I just, you know, chuck that thought in as a, in the context of handling of some of our budget issues. But my um, final thought is one that I make extremely tentatively, because I wouldn't normally suggest briefing an opposition party. However, <laughs> precisely because of the, the hookup between the administration and the Green Party, I do wonder whether there's some mileage in offering a proactive briefing to the Green Party in Scotland. Clearly that would have to be done with Kirsty's 
agreement and um, offline agreement from SG and the minister, blah, blah, blah. But there may be some um, longer term, slightly more strategic benefit in ensuring that those ministers are fully cited on this work because it has struck me as an absolute exemplar um, of how to come at this kind of thing, just as I you know, digested and reflected on the report. So I think I'm I think I'm saying it might be time to show off a wee bit in and around this area because it pulls together a number of potentially quite helpful strands for it. Just before, Just before I, I bring Stuart in on that. Uh, there's a slight echo there. Oh, no, it's OK now. Uh, just before I bring Stuart in, um, I, I just want to expand on one aspect that uh, Angelina just touched on there. And uh, Angelina gave um, a, a, a slightly uh, multidimensional view on something that occurred to me is I wonder whether or not there is any. Or whether or not you've already explored this anyway, which you may well have done is of carbon neutral funding for this sort of thing. And, and I think that's probably implicit in what Angelina was saying, but that struck me as one of my questions that I wanted to ask you is I wonder whether or not there's something there that, you know, here we are getting money for electric cars to reduce our carbon footprint. And actually, um, if, if we're doing 50 percent, what did you say, 50 percent of the UK? Wow, yeah, that, that was a mind boggling statistic. Um, over to Stuart. Thanks, and it's a really good point that Angelina raises in terms of um, a kind of business case to Scottish government to support this area of work. Um, you know, we're already putting quite considerable funding in towards the, 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 the wildfire strategy, but clearly there's a lot more that we'd like to do, both from an operational perspective, but also from a prevention perspective and, and modelling and, and, and all those things as well. So, um, new Dimensions is that the, the Home Office led programme that looks at the national risk uh, register and risk assessment and it looks at CBRN and, and things like that. Um, we pushed quite hard for wildfires to be considered as part of that and it wasn't taken on board by the, the Home Office. Subsequently, the Home Office have also said that they're not prepared to fund New Dimensions 2 directly, which means there won't be any banner consequentials that flow to Scotland to support national resilience uh, assets. That said, Scottish Government recognised that our assets need to be uh, replaced, our current assets need to be replaced, and the Scottish risk assessment helpfully has wildfire and the implications of wildfire and the climate implications of it attached to that. So the business case I've asked my team to prepare is around um, looking at the Scottish risk assessment and factoring into the business case the need for us to have more uh, wildfire specialist resources, equipment, prevention, all that kind of stuff as well. So, so we're already progressing that, Angela, in terms of trying to open the door to additional funding to support that, that area of work. In terms of your point around about that political, I, I really welcome an off-table discussion on that because I think there probably is some, some merit in doing that uh, and, and getting that broader support in terms of what we're trying to do here and indeed showing off all the work that Bruce and the team have done so far as well. So thank you. If you're OK with that, Angelina and Stuart, uh, can we just take that as an informal action rather than a formal action for the meeting? Thank you. Chair, if I could just add to that um, that feedback from Stuart sure. there. Um, the, Stuart quite rightly points out that there's a, a Scottish risk assessment that includes wildfire, um, and that's a, an offshoot of the national risk assessment compiled by UK government. Um, wildfire doesn't feature on the UK level risk assessment um but it, it absolutely does within the scottish one and, and um collectively we as part of the scottish welfare forum were instrumental in getting that risk measured correctly and entered into the scottish risk assessment but just in the last couple of weeks i've been asked for my thoughts and comments and any help i can give to the uk national risk assessment for wildfire um, and that's through um, Chief Fire Officer Paul Henley from Northumberland Fire and Rescue Service, who is the NFCC lead for the Wildfire Work Stream. Um, so I've given uh, the Scottish reasonable worst case scenario, which is what the risk assessment is built upon, and um, already have had some very favourable feedback from them. So it seems that that the work we've done in Scotland is now beginning to resonate with our colleagues in Westminster um, in relation to the welfare risk and how we might promote it across the UK. Um, so it, it's interesting to see that what Scotland is doing is being clearly seen as a, a, a logical way forward by the rest of the UK. Marvellous, thank you Bruce, thank you. 
Can I just ask a couple of very quick questions? Um, I'm presuming this work is being fed into the SDMP and, and the SDMP is, 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 has got a, a watching eye on um, the general tenant of what Bruce's work is, is involving. Yes, yeah, so I, I've had some meetings um, with John McDonald previously and Andy Garrity subsequently uh, on exactly that about where we're putting our resources, how it links in with SDMP and just to make sure there's no conflict or challenge that might come from that. Sure, thank you. Um, and forgive me if this is in your uh, if this is in your report and I've not clocked it. What off the top of your head, and please don't uh, don't feel under pressure. This what percentage of wildfires are cure, are caused by muir burn? Is it, is it how much? Sorry, three percent. And what's the what's the largest cause of wildfire? The public. In in what way though? Is there public like discarding things deliberately, setting things fire a fire? Yeah, so I, I've been flipping and seeing the public. I usually say the largest cause of wildfire is men, women, and children, um, and you know that's not too distant, too um, inaccurate. So we did a bit of research um, to identify exactly what um, proportion of fires were caused by muir burn, and that was on the back of a, a very unhelpful document that was circulated by somebody with an agenda, um, who said that it was in the high sixty percent. So we used the exact same data source, which was actually our IRS data, um, and had it, that analysis carried out both by our own internal analysts and um, peer reviewed, and it came out at less than 3%, uh, but 3% ostensibly of, of wildfire in the, with the criteria that applies to what something can be called a wildfire um, is caused by muir burn. The main fires, and this was something that um, we had a little bit of research carried out uh, as part of something called a visathon. So we did a visit on with the NHS Data Services. It's an event, a, a fun event that they do every year where they get all their analysts together along with the, uh, the vendor of the, um, the software they use and they see how, how they can present data in a, a, a sensible, logical, easy to understand way from the same data source. And the, the ask that we gave them if, was if they could identify trends in relation to when, where and how fires started, um, because there's some assumptions that are, are out there about how fires are started. Um, and, and what we were able to say is that um, there's no correlation with public holidays, which was one assumption that had been made beforehand, which that tends to be when you get more people going out. But there is a correlation with um, the road network uh, and laybys in particular. Um, so the, the, what we can not not just using that that visit on data, but using um, other data sources. The wildfires that we have tend to be started by people in the countryside accidentally um, starting them, either through complete ignorance to the risk that exists. So many people will not realise that this is the worst time of year for wildfires. People think this is um, safe, and we actually have had some quite significant criticism on social media when we put out a fire danger rating in. Um, well, it was in the uh, March. To, it was a beast from the east that uh, was was on the go, and we, we got told they were too early for April Fools when we put out our um, extreme fire rating um, warning. Uh, but we had huge fires on Sky that very weekend, and we actually had fire appliances driving through snow drifts to get to these huge fires. So um, this is the worst time of year for fire. So the public going to the countryside, they don't understand the risk. They um, enjoy the countryside with barbecues and campfires and alarmingly there's a growing industry with people teaching others how to um, go off grid and live in the countryside and, and fire lighting tends to be part of that. Um, so people go out with the best of intentions but accidentally um, a fire starts and it, at this time of year in particular there's such an abundance of really dry fuel vegetation um, available that when a fire does start it grows incredibly quickly and, and spreads extremely rapidly across the countryside. Wow. <clears throat> right. OK, thank you. Yeah, no, that was interesting. Very, very interesting. Very educational. Thank you. Yeah, massive subject and uh, one that, uh, as, as everybody acknowledges, is quite an eye opening report and one that's so vital to to uh, our collective future. Thank you um, and thank you, Bruce. Um, very interesting. Thank okay. you. Um, let's move on now then to the service delivery risk register and over to uh, it's down as 
Ross, but um, I thought, uh, is it right? Are you Ross? Sorry, apologies. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, there's, there's two items um, that we're going to discuss. One is the director aligned risks that are the responsibility of scrutiny of the service delivery committee, which is what I'm just going to give a very quick overview of, but I'll keep it very brief, Chair, because I'm conscious of time and that the risk register is there. Um, and then Stuart is going to talk to a specific risk risk spotlight regarding our operational resilience uh, over the Omicron period. Uh, so that will give a wee bit of a focus. But in terms of the general risk register, um, hopefully members are familiar with the format. Uh, we have got uh, the report with uh, an appendix with a number of different sub appendices within that. So we've got the strategic risk summary at appendix 1A. We've got the aligned direct, direct risk summary, which are those risks that the SDC has got responsibility for scrutinising at Appendix 1B. We've got the control summary for those direct risks at 1C. Closed direct risks at 1D. We have got the closed risk summary at 1E, which is blank because there are there is a null return there. We've got the uh, change summary at 1F. We've got a blank um, 1G, which is new direct risk summary, and we've got um, new direct control summary at 1H, which is any new direct controls that have been put in place. So that's the different appendices that make up the report. I won't go into any detail, Chair, because as I say, Stuart is going to give a, a deep dive into the resilience round with Omicron which is a feature of the risk register, but I'm happy to take any questions on any of the risks or the control measures that are presented within the report. Thanks. OK, thank you, uh, Ross, for that oversight of the report. I'll just kick off. Um, looking at page 100 of the total uh, meeting pages and seven of 25 of this particular paper, when we look at the um, item strategic risk ID six, um, direct at risk SD001 and then SD003. The summary of those two meetings, which is talking about the failure um, initially to mobilize an incident to do with the technical failure of the existing mobilizing system. And then the following report uh, uh, risk broadly as I read it and I've read it a few times broadly says something very similar what is the could you just explain the subtlety of those two different risks please uh, do you want me to put it up there yes so the, the first one Nick is the operations control mobilizing systems the second one relates to the supporting systems called Gartan and Kronos that monitor the RVDS availability. So it's a live system that tells us what appliances are available. So that's nearing end of life and that's part of the PTFES project to replace those. Uh, thank you. Yes, and as soon as you started explaining that, then the uh, the penny dropped with me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there was one other I had. No, no, I'm, I'm OK with that. I'm. Let me ask you, sorry, there was, there was one right at the far, far end. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, my phone's just kicking off on one side. Um, in terms of the reserves, reserved matters and the implementation of the MTA strategy, how is that affected by the interim nature of the MTA response solution that we have at the moment, as opposed to a permanent solution? So the current interim position is that it's in place until 31st of March of this year, um, after which if we don't extend the current ag agreement, we won't have a formalised MTA response. The engagement is ongoing at the moment with those current volunteers to extend um, subject to the ongoing high level discussions that are taking place between the chief fire officer, the chief of the board and the MJC facilitated talks 
to have a permanency of that arrangement going forward. So um, that's where we are at the moment, Mick. I, I'm not in a position at the moment to, to provide an update in terms of, you know, will we have a, a team beyond beyond 31st of March? And hopefully we will, but I'll be able to provide a bit more detail in future on that. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes my questions. Does anybody else have any questions on the risk register as it stands at the moment? Leslie. Thanks, Nick. Uh, it's in page uh, 116. And it's to do with the um, SD004. It's to do with the mobile delivery platform. And these are the, the, the tablets, I think, that are being carried in the cabs here. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times elsewhere in the papers, but where are we on this and how confident are we that uh, we'll uh, get to a position where it's all working uh, OK in the coming months? Okay, so there's been some ongoing challenges in terms of the tablets at, at the moment, and it's part of a number of projects uh, in vehicle solutions project, the operational documents project. Um, there are some challenges around about getting more information onto the tablets. There is a joint paper coming to the SNB in the very near future uh, between ICT and service delivery, which sets out a number of options and a plan to address that. Um, I think it's in one of the HMI updates as well, it references the work that ICT are doing. ICT have a plan in place to, uh, I think it's quarter one of next year, have a solution in place to, to deal with that, Wesley. But as things stand at the moment, the, the, the GTAC tablet situation still remains challenging. OK, thanks. Yeah, that, it's, um, it, it is a challenging environment by the sounds of that, and uh, it's definitely reflected in that risk and uh, that, that it's inter interlinked with a number of other things, which I think we may come on with the HMFSI action plans as well. So um, I, I think we're, we're, we're noting that, Stuart, and uh, uh, yeah, comple complex issues at the moment. Um, thank you. Let's. Um, conclude that uh, item 11.1 .1 and move to 11.2 um, and the risk spotlight back to you, Stuart. And please forgive me, Stuart, I'm just going to be absent for about uh, 30 seconds, but please no carry on. Thanks, Chair. OK, thanks, uh, uh, colleagues. So the risk spotlight that we've provided here uh, focuses on the ongoing impact uh, of COVID on service delivery uh, and sets out the various actions and control measures that we have uh, and continue to deploy in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, there's a particular focus on the emergence of the Omicron variant uh, and the significant impact which that had uh, on the service, particularly over uh, the recent uh, festive period. And I think it's fair to say that this, this variant tested our business continuity planning arrangements significantly uh, and was much more impactful on the previous uh, variants and peaks that we experienced. And there's clearly a number of factors that, that um, tie in with that and the societal factors, namely that the wider restrictions that were in place during the previous uh, variants and, and peaks weren't in place over this period, so society was essentially open as normal um, and people could go about their business and, and clearly that may have contributed to the wider spread of, of, of that variant. Um, as the Omicron variant began to emerge, we were asked to model 25% uh, absence levels by Scottish Government and provide them with assurance that we could continue to meet our statutory duties and what we put in place to, to do that, uh, which we did. And at the time, we thought 25% seemed a bit, uh, you know, challenging and high. Uh, however, as it transpired, that, that, that was pretty, pretty accurate. And I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. Um, so in preparation for the anticipated peak, we re-established um, our processes. So the, the tag process, which I chair, the gold process, uh, which is SLT chaired by the chief officer, uh, and the CRAG process, which is the Community Resilience Assistance Group, which is essentially how we can support local partners and, and local authorities, um, like what we've done the last time in terms of providing support to a humanitarian hubs, delivering goods, whatever it may be. And so all those will be established and uh, are well tested business continuity, continuity arrangements and suite of options and, and staffing options that we have in place and the various levers that we can pull to ensure that we can maintain operational resilience we're all put into place and stood up at pace. I think it's safe to say that much of what we learned over the previous two years uh, stood us in good stead and we were able to draw upon that experience and as I say, all those processes that we had developed. 
Um, the actual impact of Omicron w w was felt really, really swiftly by the organisation in the two weeks prior to, to, uh, to, to Christmas. Um, significant absence levels were encountered almost immediately, um, and that went on until uh, around about the end of January. Um, I mentioned before we were asked to model 25% absence levels. Uh, at the peak, we experienced about a 28% absence level across the organisation, and average across December and start of January was 22%. So in line with predictions, and, and just to put that into context, our business as usual pre-pandemic absence rate is around about 10%. So it just kind of shows the, the level of that. Um, that also included other seasonal issues, uh, not just COVID uh, in terms of absences. What it also says we needed to factor in a 5% shortfall in the current target operating model, which has been brought about by our inability to train as many staff due to the restrictions that train have in place in terms of core sizes. So that 5% on top of the 28%, we're, we're looking at 30% plus absence levels. Um, just to, to perhaps bring that into a bit of you know, um, reality, for, for, to, to crew the organisation, the whole time element of the organisation on a daily basis, at absolute minimum, we require 438 uh, firefighters. Uh, and on one day pre-Christmas, pre we had 317 firefighters available for duty that day. So quite a significant shortfall in terms of what we needed. It was also the impact wasn't uniform across the different staffing groups and a different, across the different watches. So one, some watches were um, impacted more heavily than, than other watches. And that was due to the, you know, when they were off and time off and motor days and things like that as well. And geographically, the West service delivery area was, was the most hit in terms of frontline uh, firefighters. Um, our flexi duty officer cadre was also significantly impacted uh, over the period, um, as was our operations control room uh, OC. They, they faced some real challenges over, over that period. And um, I'm hugely grateful to the support that was shown by the OC staff and also ex OC staff. So, staff who originally joined control and then joined the, the, the whole time firefighter part of the organisation they volunteered to come back and support the OC staff. So that showed the kind of criticality in terms of staffing within, within OC of that period. And, and I had a number as with the debt of sleepless nights over that period in terms of uh, particularly OC. Um, I don't intend to go through all the measures that we, we, we put in place and those are set out in, the, in, in the, the, the report and hopefully that provides a sense of the, the enormous amount of work that went in to maintain resilience across the organisation during that period. And, um, I must highlight the incredible work that was shown and the fortitude that was shown by all our staff, but in particular, our central staffing team, who were absolutely superb over that period under really, really difficult circumstances, and indeed the, the officers who helped keep things going under enormous pressure in what was a, a hugely dynamic situation, and we're having to make numerous cover moves to address the shortfalls and the confidence levels. So if a, a normal confidence level is around about 96%, and at times we were way below 90%, but we kind of hovered around about 90% for over that period. Uh, I'd also like to highlight the commitment that was shown by all our staff in order to come to work and keep our community safe. It's never lost in me throughout the, the course of the pandemic that our staff, most of our staff cannot work from home. They have to attend the workplace in order to, to provide the service. And, and I'm sure that that brings trepidation in terms of potential to be exposed and, and carry the virus back to, 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 to their homes and to their families as well. So that's never lost on me. Um, as ever over that period, I think there's some huge learning. And um, so we'll do a structured debrief. We'll evaluate the, the measures we put in place uh, and we'll further develop our business continuity planning arrangements uh, as we move forward. And I think the DEF is going to talk about that in more detail tomorrow as part of the board uh, strategy. So. Uh, I'll pause at that, colleagues. Hopefully, that gives you a sense of the challenge that we faced over over the festive period due to Omicron. But I'm happy to take any questions or, or expand upon any areas. Thank you, Stuart. Um, well done. Uh, yeah, incredibly difficult and 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 uh, time. And I'm not surprised you had sleepless nights with those sorts sorts of statistics. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I'll just reiterate that. Well done to you and and everybody, all the whole team and and all those that have been involved with that. It just goes to show just how crippling um, crippling something like this happens. I, I I remember years and years ago putting in place um, mitigating measures around uh, a flu pandemic, you know, and, and when people said, oh, could you could you continue to deliver the services with, you know. 
10% reduction and, uh, you know, you threw your arms up in horror, didn't you? And then 15% or, tw you know, let's go to worst case, 20% of your work staff, uh, you, you know, and, and years ago, we, we just couldn't really properly have envisaged what, what was on the horizon in 2020. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite staggering, really, and, and incredible that the work has contributed over those that past previous 18 months that roll into this uh, uh, Omicron uh, part of it. Anyway, but but thank you. Uh, it's a really good point, Nick, and, and uh, I always have a chuckle when I, I read the previous pan flu policy we had in place because you think that it was nowhere near, and it was, a, it was an excellent document, but nowhere near the actual reality of what we've actually had to deal with over the, the last few years. And, as I say, we've learned so much from it in terms of going forward, in terms of business continuity. Essentially, business continuity all boils down to the same thing, an absence of staff. So we're going to be able to really streamline how we do business continuity planning, and, and, and Richard and the team are, are looking at that in a moment as well. So thanks, Nick. Marvellous. OK, thank you. Um, Tim, over to you. Stuart, thanks for that. And uh, I'll just echo Nick's comments and congratulations on the way you managed it through the, that process. Just preempting our next service delivery um, committee meeting, with with that constraint on resource, are we likely to see an impact in some of the uh, the, the activity reports? And so, should we kind of preempt that now? Should we see any of the stats take a bit of a dip? And if so, which ones? Should we, so we don't get particularly alarmed next time we see them. Yeah, I think the only stat that you may see taking a slight dip would be the home fire safety stats, because clearly we had to withdraw slightly from that face-to-face -face community engagement. Um, but again, we had really robust and, and well-developed safe systems to work to allow us to still do high-risk individuals. So um, th there may be a slight hit on that. In terms of response times and operational, I don't think you will see any impact on that, Tim, which is really kind of speaks to the, the, the professionalism and, and the the work that was done over that period to make sure that there was no uh, impact on community outcomes um, over that period. That's great, thanks. Uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart, Tim, thank you. Um, anybody else? Any further comments to add on that? No, okay. Do a really excellent little spotlight a report that um, and Sorry, I said a little there. That's absolutely not appropriate. <laughs> Massive piece of work, concise report, uh, very appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we'll conclude that 11.2 item. Now I see Richard. Welcome, Richard. Nice to see you um, with us. And could we put you deep into the, uh, the sorry, into the deep end and we'll jump to 8.2 the HMFSI action plans before we then move to item 12 and an update from Robert. So we'll go to you, Richard, first, please, if that's OK. Yes, of course. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all again. Um, Richard Wetton, Head of Governance, Strategy and Performance. So uh, members and colleagues will be um, used to this by now. This is our regular update at uh, the committee of our uh, progress through audit and inspection action plans and closing reports, etc. The report before you today has a number of um, updates against a range of reports that are provided for you. Um, as per the normal running order chair, uh, I assume we'll go through them individually, then I'll pause if we've got any questions. Um, the first one uh, members will see is the fleet and equipment action plan. Um, this uh, is complete. Um, the only Slight delay on the closure report has really just been down to um, constraints in, in the team for getting the reports done. So we would have hoped to have brought it to the last SMB a few weeks ago for closure. Um, but we, did, we weren't able to do that, but it, it is done and we will bring it forward to the next uh, SMB. So it will be reported in the, um, the next quarterly report. But effectively, that one is now green for us and 100% complete. And we can give you the detail of that when when we're next through. Thank you, and I'll look forward to um, to seeing that at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the next one is the operational risk uh, information. This report published in, in uh, February 2019. Um, range of actions already complete. Progress this quarter has been limited. No further actions have been completed against that. You can see the 
dashboard provided for you in detail uh, within the annex uh, uh, appendix B material. So this is really just in terms of uh, the, the ongoing issues around uh, ENC, ESMCP and Airwave, which we're well aware of in terms of the, the, the ongoing issues with that project, which we're running into a, a long, long time now. So in terms of how we look at these things, whilst the um, overall RAG status of this will remain red until those things are resolved because of those timing constraints, um, the overall action plan complete, completion is 90%. And you'll probably be aware that there has been finally some movement on that project. Uh, a new a new project director, I understand, has been appointed by the Home Office. There has been some movement on those things. Sandra has, has, has given us updates to SMB on that. So it, it isn't just a static picture at last, it is actually moving. Um, but from our perspective, it is still a red. Thank you, Chair. Do any colleagues have any questions? I've got a couple, but do any colleagues have any questions on that? Uh, Richard, uh, the, the, um, there were a couple of comments made previously in the meeting that you will be aware of, but I, I don't think it it's necessarily uh, affects this too much, except that to say how th this this action, th sorry, this action plan in particular is uh, dependent on so many mm -hmm. big projects elsewhere. And you know, when we're moving in with a home office, we can but just sit on our hands and wait until we see what happens. What's the com what's the sort of confidence level around that first point um, in terms of the integration with Airwave post mm -hmm. the CCMS project? And that was the bit that caught my eye a little bit there about the CCMS is obviously undergoing some pretty significant issues. Mm -hmm. What what what's the implement? Uh, what's the implication and, the, and therefore the confidence with this um, and, and and therefore sorry what's the confidence and therefore what's the implication sorry I'll stop waffling okay a difficult one for me to fully answer chair and give you a, 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 a full answer to that one I think committee members because as you say there's a lot there's a lot happening in that at the moment I think you know clearly in terms of the project uh, CCMS and the and the the um, connection to ESMCP has always been part of that and is and is regularly discussed. But as you say, um, confidence levels um, have been uh, hit in terms of the the overall project, as you're all aware. Um, and and the ESMCP has always been uh, a a very specific issue for us in terms of, as you say, we've been waiting for it. I mean, in terms of me being able to give a confidence assessment, I don't think I can. Um, I don't know if colleagues could either on that. Let me just let me just pause, pause the um, uh, Richard. Thank you for that input. Uh, Robert, is this to do with this particular point? Yes, Chair, it is um, in relation to this particular paper. Um, I think there's a couple of points worth stating. First of all, it's very easy to be negative and look at the reds on all of these reports. I think I, I've said it before and I just want to say it again for the record. It's very pleasing when you look at the greens and more pleasing when you look at the areas that are greyed out and complete. And I think that shows the absolute benefit of us producing reports and recommendations and turning them into improvement. And that's what we're here to do. So, you know, just to state that and get that on the record again, that is pleasing. In this particular paper in relation to the GTEC tablets, however, I think it's worth pointing out that it's a recurring theme through a lot of inspections that we carry out, you know, the satisfaction with the Ops Intelligence tablets uh, is raised through local area inspections and on, on some thematic inspections, and it's likely to continue within uh, thematic inspections as we move forward until it is resolved to the satisfaction of your, your end users ultimately um, and in line with the recommendations. And I think you know, I'm not an ICT expert, and I know some in the room are, but the report was produced in 2019 and when you start seeing uh, conclusion dates moving into 2023, some four years after the report, you question has IT moved on, you know, in that time period and, you know, our consideration has been given to the product and the suitability of the product and, and Leslie teased some of those things out during her very helpful question earlier on, um, so I don't plan on revisiting them, but I'm just hopeful that when Sandra does bring that paper to um, 
to SMB and beyond that it includes an option for considering new technologies? Because I imagine there are new technologies that have uh, come to the fore over that four year period. Hey, your point's well made, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I think I'll just uh, probably just note note the report as it is, uh, unless any, any colleagues have particular other points. I think we'll just note this and perhaps um, perhaps review this in, in in slower time, in due course, and take um, take counsel from um, uh, Ross and his team of specialists. Richard. Well, I was just going to make one final point in that, whilst it's clear that the recommendations here. Um, and the broader work does have a great deal of dependency on a on a much larger project, you know, a UK wide project, which which obviously we could take the view of well, you know, we're kind of as part of that's very difficult to 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 see that through because of the size and complexity and the lateness of it. I think also we we might also want to look at it from the point of view it's very useful to have um, that continuing. Uh, reminder of this and certainly from a perspective at SMB you know Sandra is regularly involved she's in you know she's engaged she's representing the services interest and in trying to make sure that this thing actually happens because um, not just for CCMS but for a range of reasons the, 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 the this new thing has been uh, this new um, a replacement for airwave has been around for a long time we're waiting for this it's important so um, Yes, it might be into interdependencies, which are very difficult for us to have confidence in and, and influence, but it's it's important. It remains high on our agenda, I think. I quite, quite agree. Quite agree. Um, unless there are any further questions, please, um, we'll we'll note that and. Move on to the next action plan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the next one is the planning and preparedness for COVID-19. Please, please um, excuse me. Sorry, uh, Richard, I've got an essential phone call I just need to take. I'm sorry. Ca please carry on. OK, Chair. Um, colleagues, planning and preparedness for COVID-19 update. This report was, was as you know, brought to us uh, by the inspectorate uh, in terms of what was seen as a, a light touch report, but also a very helpful report at the time purposely done in that way by the inspector and his team. The plan contains a total of 16 actions to address the recommendations that were made. Um, seven of the actions are new. Remaining 10 actions are being progressed through other work streams. So to date, we've got eight complete, eight progressing steadily, five marked green and, and three marked amber. So the reg, RAG status for the overall um, action plan remains green. Uh, and uh, estimated completion of 80 to 86 percent, and you can see that on the appendix attached. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I have no further questions on that. Does anybody okay. else? Okay. Nope. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, the next report is command and control aspects of the incident command system. Um, 25 actions overall, uh, and this is Appendix D. Um, to date, the uh, range of actions have been completed. The remaining five actions are progressing. However, four remain amber, and this is slip in time scales. So you, you'll note that uh, you are you are asked to note the following in terms of re revised time scales um, for 5.2.4, 5.2.5. Um, and a revised due date proposed for 5.3.9 as well, and that is Appendix D. Again, um, I made some notes, read it through with interest. I don't have any further comments. Does anybody else? No, OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, OK, next one is the fire, fire safety enforcement action plan. Um, so we've got re a, a single remaining live action, which is almost complete. Um, and this is really just one we've had for a while, which is about the actual procedure being fully reviewed and then and then um, uh, given the given the OK to continue. So before I was off, um, I ch I chased this because we've had this sitting as a the legal team will review it for quite a while, but we've not had it to review, um, but I was promised that it, it we would get it. Um, so uh, 
uh, and we're still awaiting that report. At least that, that that's what I understand as, as of a few weeks ago, but I can follow that up. Uh, as soon as the team, as soon as our team get that report, we we, we turn these things around very quickly. So I've no, I've no, uh, no doubt that once that's it, that's done, we can finish that off and get it get it closed. Um, there's other two deferred actions, as you see, which which have been reviewed, but timescales have not been set by NFCCC for those. RAG status remains red, uh, just as slippage of timescales, but overall it's it's almost complete. And I'm presuming you don't foresee any issues with the completion of the, the action. No. OK. And the the other point I had was. We might be down in the devil of detail here on the way we govern, govern our action plans, but the two deferred actions have um, a review again by December 21 dates in the far right hand column. Mm -hmm. And therefore. That probably needs updating if, if, if indeed you do update a deferred item. Yeah, well, it's, I'll, just, I'll I'll it's, just a remi it's a reminder for us to go and check it. Yeah, OK. Yeah. okay. Um, again, um, thank you. Yeah. No further other things from me. Okay, last last set. Sorry, there's been so many this this quarter. Uh, local area inspections, national recommendation of action plan. As you know, the local inspections um, have a range of recommendations that that uh, are both local and national, um, and and they they are uh, provided for you. Although members are not required to to provide any detailed oversight of the local recommendations, but they're there for you uh, uh, should you wish to. Um, the remaining actions that we have pertain to the Midlothian Local Area Action Plan. As you can see, the report published in 2021, total of seven actions identified to address the five recommendations. Um, so against the action plan, there are currently three actions, two of these completed including one which has been completed within the, the last period. Um, the remaining action is to progress ICT work to develop business case for presentation to the uh, asset management liaison board. Um, this action is progressing. We're expecting that to, to go to AMLB in March. So overall, RAG status is green, noted at 90% complete. So we're almost there with that one as well. Thank you. No further questions from me and one from Malcolm. Uh, thanks. Yeah, just a minor one. Um, at the table at the top left, you're saying there's one action in progress, uh, but there's actually two listed in the table. Uh, now, that may be what you're saying, that one has currently been updated. It is actually <laughs> complete, uh, but I just wonder if that is the best, most consistent way to present that. So, so something maybe to to consider are you reporting two different time scales? Is the one at the top current and the one below showing progress from the last meeting? If you see what I mean. Yes, um, yes. So, so um, it, it, it's fine. And because you mentioned it just now, I understood it, but it was a question in my mind uh, before you, you commented on it. Thanks, Malcolm. Lovely. Thank you. And I see that now as the um, the end of that article. Thanks very much, Richard. Look forward to the closing report for the uh, fleet next time. And um, yeah, that's where we're sitting with that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let me just check. We're not going to miss anything out here. We're we'll jump now to item 12 and um, Robert. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, quite a lot of this will be repetitive in nature because we had our workshop fairly recently and I gave you an update at that workshop. But for the benefit of the recording, I think it's appropriate to run through the paper uh, somewhat briefly. Um, so you'll see on the paper that we uh, break down our activity and progress into local area inspections. You'll be aware that we published a local area inspection report relating to Argyle and Butte in December, and that's been received into the service for consideration on how they'll action those recommendations. Uh, and our final local area inspection ever uh, is now complete in terms of field work, uh, and that's of the Angus area. Uh, that has been sent to the service for consultation, and there's a four week consultation period with the uh, local senior officer being the main uh, recipient, but also being flagged up to the chief officer uh, for his information. There are no national recommendations within that report. There are only two local recommendations within it. It was actually a, a very 
pleasant one to finish on, if I can use that term, because uh, we were received very well and we got a lot of very positive soundings from staff and from partners, which is always great. Um, so there were only two recommendations within the report, both local and context, so there'll be nothing coming to your table as service delivery uh, committee. You'll be glad to hear. Uh, and that brings us on to item 3.2 on the paper, which is that move to the service delivery area inspection. Now, again, I don't plan on going into this in detail because you've heard that on a number of occasions, but we are on track to move to that new process of uh, inspecting performance at service delivery area level rather than a local authority level. Uh, and we have begun our work on fleshing out what that might look like. We came together as an inspectorate team last Wednesday. Unfortunately, Storm Dudley had other plans for us, so we came together physically, and poor Rick had to travel up from Leicester uh, at great uh, expense and time, uh, only to be turned around immediately and put back on a train and sent back home because of the weather uh, that was coming in and the recommendations uh, on travel. So sadly, we didn't get the full benefit of that, but we did make a bit of progress um, whilst we were together. And the, the kind of current update on that is we still plan on measuring performance at the local senior officer level and then, you know, uh, adding those sort of performances together to determine what the picture looks like at a service delivery area level against the four themes that we've spoke about before, prevention, response, people and partnership. Now, what we're exploring now is how we measure against these themes. Uh, and what we've been doing is trawling through the framework and trawling through your own um, your own strategic documents in the service for statements that you have made or statements that have been asked of you by government in relation to those themes. Uh, and, and we will therefore play those statements back to see whether or not you have achieved what you said you would in your strategic documents. Um, you know, if you have an aspiration of what the service is supposed to look like, then we're going to measure that against those themes and find data that supports that or dispels it, I suppose. Um, and that, that's the sort of approach we plan on taking. But I think one of the most important things to, to bear in mind is in the tone that we set during that get together last week was that this report is to provide assurance to ministers and the people of Scotland that the service is performing in an efficient and effective manner. So the end audience here has to be the people of Scotland. It has to be written in a way that can be understood and therefore it is likely to be um, you know, light in its, its tone. Um, and whilst there will be data within it and there will be performance reporting within it, it has to be easily understood uh, by the general public and not necessarily as in-depth and uh, complex as some of our thematics might be. And I think that's an appropriate tone because the whole idea of this is for me to be able to fulfil my statutory obligation of providing that assurance. Um, and, uh, you know, I think being quite frank about it, that the 16 year turnaround that was the previous um, inspection regime didn't give me that comfort and would never have gave me that comfort unless I'd stayed here for another 16 years, which I don't plan on doing. You'll be glad to hear. Um, so the three year turnaround is much more achievable and I think much more appropriate. We've also been engaging with local authorities, starting with COSLA in the first instance and now with the individual local authorities to give them assurance that we will still consider them in this process. We will still engage with each of the local authorities during this process process and, and we will certainly be uh, you know meeting with them and seeking views as to their relationship with the service because that is a fundamental part of the act whilst it is a national service it has to deliver locally and we will inspect against that element um, so I think that's enough on the service delivery area inspection and our plans to move forward. The only other thing worthy of discussion, I think, are the, the two thematics that are ongoing. Uh, health and safety and operational focus has now concluded um, and we have a draft report. Uh, in the interests of no surprises, as I set out when I first took on this post, I shared the draft report in a very uh, rudimentary format with uh, ACO Dickey and his team. Uh, to get their initial feedback before we moved into a formal consultation. And I think that was a very helpful way to do it. And, and hopefully John will agree that, you know, that informal consultation let the subject matter experts get into that draft and come back with some really useful feedback. 
that we have considered and on some occasions incorporated into changes within the report. But to get that done prior to going to formal consultation, obviously elongates the process a little bit, but I think you actually get a reward at the end of that, that you know a lot of the, the real technical questions have been uh, considered at a much earlier stage. So that's what we've done and that's what we plan on doing with future reports moving forward is to have that informal dialogue before we move to formal consultation and hopefully that's welcomed. Um, the report uh, is slightly different in format and you'll see it when it comes before you that it not only has recommendations of which there are eight but it also has areas for consideration which in some way are a little bit lighter in tone to the actual direct recommendations. Obviously your statutory duty is to have regard to the entire report and therefore you could be argued that you have to have actions against both. But the other thing that's different about this report and, and uh, at the risk of embarrassing Rick Taylor, he's the, he's the lead author of this report. What's different within this report is that it also highlights areas of good practice and I think in the interest of providing that balanced uh, measurement of the, the service against this theme, I think it's really useful for us to not only present recommendations, but also to reflect where the service is doing particularly well. Um, and I think Rick's done a good job of providing that balanced uh, tone. We again will take your feedback on that and it may be something that we include in future reports as well. I certainly like that idea. Uh, the other one that's ongoing at the moment is firefighting. Sorry, time scales wise, the formal consultation will start uh, on Monday next week. It's a three week, three week consultation and, and then we have to go through the process of laying this document before Parliament. Unfortunately, we're likely to miss the Easter recess and it will be post Easter recess that it gets laid before Parliament, which means it will be published probably in May. Uh, so we slightly miss our deadline, but I think it was worth doing that to get that informal element factored in. The firefighting and high rise buildings thematic is ongoing. We've carried out all of the field work that we plan on carrying out in Scotland, but we also wanted to have a look across the rest of the country about how other services were responding to incidents in high rise buildings uh, and how they were reacting to the uh, output from the Grenfell inquiry. So I'm off to London next week to meet with London Fire Brigade, who clearly have a, a key role within that whole uh, subject. Um, Rick is going to West Midlands to meet with colleagues there and we've also approached uh, Northern Ireland to get uh, a look at the policies and procedures that they have in place. That's the sort of three areas that we're going to be looking at across the the rest of the UK and it's not an it's not a bid to try and compare and contrast Scotland's approach to any other. It's just for us to have that wider appreciation of what others might be doing and where there might be areas of best practice that could be picked up on. I'm absolutely sure Stuart is doing the exact same thing in his role uh, as are others. So, so far um, we are well on way with the, the field work and we plan on laying that report before Parliament in May uh, also. So two fairly meaty reports coming your way. Um, from the inspector in May of next year. Uh, in terms of next year's plan, I, I mentioned briefly when Bruce was on the call that we plan on carrying out a thematic looking at the operational impacts of climate change. This is one of two thematics that I've got on, uh, on my plans relating to climate change. The first one being the operational impacts and the extreme weather elements. The second one being how the service is moving towards that carbon neutrality. And I know that Ian Morris and his team have certainly got a lot of great ideas about uh, your new estate and your new vehicles, etc. moving forward to move to that carbon neutral position. So that again, I think will come forward at a future point, maybe next year or maybe the year after on the inspectorate's plan. But right now we're looking at the operational impacts of climate change and that will be one of two thematics. The other thematic that we'll carry out next year is in relation to mental health and well-being and how the service is supporting its staff uh, around that very important subject. And I know that's going to be a really good balanced report because I'm already aware of some of the great stuff that's going on. But we will obviously be looking at the cultural issues around the whole issue of mental health and, and we plan on getting out and meeting as many partners as we can and as many members of staff as we can can uh, to provide that report. So that's the two thematics next year, along with the service delivery area inspection of the East SDA. Um, and that pretty much concludes it, other than to give a quick mention to staff who have departed uh, the inspectorate since our last meeting. Steve Harkins 
uh, has been seconded to the inspectorate for about uh, 18 months. And, and this is the third time that Steve's actually been seconded to the inspectorate. He liked it that much. He came back another twice. Um, and Steve is going to be retiring from the service, uh, I think, at the end of this month, actually. Um, so we just want to place on thanks our uh, uh, sorry, on record, our thanks to the service for seconding that member of staff to us and for their continued support around the secondment of staff to the inspector. It is very helpful for us and hopefully it helps develop staff uh, through their career path also. Uh, and the other chap that's left is Assist Assistant Inspector Richard Gorst. Uh, and Richard has gone to take up a new post at the Fire Service College where I think he is being uh, uh, appointed as the Director of Sales. So Richard has moved back into the private sector and has left uh, the inspectorate. I'm going through the process of advertising for the assistant inspectors post, uh, and I'm also in discussion with the service uh, around future secondees. So we'll keep you posted when we finally get people into those jobs. But in the meantime, we're running a little bit uh, light in terms of staff, and as such, our uh, progress may be a little bit slower than I would have liked it to be. That, I think, is all I have for you, Chair, unless anyone has any questions. Robert, thank you. Um, extremely useful update and overview of your work and intentions. And I noted that John Dickey had said that he very much appreciated that uh, slightly higher level of integration. Um, I've got a couple of points to make. Sorry, I'll just say my one point, actually, and then I'll hand over to Angelina. Um, you're right, your reports are intended for the people of Scotland, obviously extremely useful for the service and particularly useful for this committee as well. And it's particularly good to hear that you're talking about not only areas for improvement, but good practice as well. And that really gives us some degree of um, a, a different aspect, as we say, a triangulation of viewpoint and uh, reassurance that um, that where things are, are being done well, they're, they're being noted. So thank you. Angelina. Thanks, Chair. I'm probably going to repeat the point you just made because that was also mine. It was to respond to Robert's invitation to give a view on the inclusion more routinely of good practice. I think that is wholly commendable. I, I, I think it's an inspector rate that makes a point of catching people doing things right is a truly enlightened inspector rate, regardless of the sector. But I think you know, culturally and at a whole le you know, umpteen levels, it is absolutely and um, ultimately the most effective way to um, to inspect. Yes, yeah, so very, very supportive of that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to both. And, and I would love to take the complete credit for that. Um, but because he's on the call, I'm going to have to say that Rick was actually the architect of that approach and credit actually lies with him. So just to credit where it is due. OK, marvellous. Thank you. And thanks to Rick as well for that. Uh, so thanks, Robert. Robert, I'm going to um, put you on the spot just uh, quickly. You did something in the sidelines about an amendment to the minutes from the previous meeting. Just for the record, because when we go back and this is a public viewing online, could you just uh, say what your um, correction to the minutes was, please, so we can record that formally? Yeah, absolutely. No problem, Nick. Um, it was within the minute of the last meeting at item 12.1. The fifth bullet point says that the, we are carrying out an inspection in relation to high, high risk buildings. It's actually high rise buildings and actually, you know, completely uh, completely the other way around. I wouldn't say they are high risk uh, in the main. So it's important to clear that one up. Lovely. Thank you. And that just completes that action. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for your report, uh, Robert. Uh, much welcomed. Let's now move on. I'm just very conscious of the time and uh, on to item 13, the committee forward plan. Um, you've got it in front of you. I'm not expecting a great deal of input from to this, except from my perspective, the climate change piece, if I am correct in my memory, Stuart. I thought we were, oh, in fact, I may have may have spotted a mistake or I, be, I may be mistaken. I thought we were doing electric vehicles next. Oh, we have flooding. 
My understanding is there's electric vehicles next as well, Nick. Yeah, OK. I think that's a, a, a slight error, which I've only this very second picked up. So I think we're doing electric vehicles next. So that's a, a slight change. If uh, if uh, Debbie could just note that, please, that doesn't necessarily need to be an action. That's just something we just need to correct. Um, does anybody have any particular items on the co committee forward plan? No. OK, committee uh, items for consideration of the future IGF board strategy information of development days. Anything there? Ross, go ahead. Apologies, Chair. I put my hand up just at the point that you were looking back down to your notes. It was in relation to the forward plan. And we had a discussion at the um, agenda setting meeting for this meeting regarding response times and a focused piece. Um, we've put it on the forward plan for the May meeting because I wasn't sure whether you were just wanting it deferred or not. So there'll be some guidance in terms of whether you want that at May or whether you want to take it off table would be helpful. Thanks. I think um, no, no, I'm happy to have that. Um, and if I recall correctly, what we were going to do is we were just going to. We, we seem to have a lot of conversations around response times, and I think it would be perhaps a good idea to bring everybody up to the same uh, basic level of understanding of what terminology is. And um, when we are talking about increases in times, we are talking about matters of seconds, really. And therefore, it may be a good idea to bring everybody up to speed uh, d um, and um, d deal with the issue in in respect of the committee's view on that and then move on and let the subject matter experts deal with any matters internally. So we'll we'll leave that there, but thanks for bringing that to my attention and clarification. Cheers. And therefore, if there's nobody else that's got anything for that, I will uh, just ask Ali uh, to do a quick review of the actions, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Group Commander Ali Cameron, Board Support Manager. So just in relation to the meeting itself, we've picked up two formal actions. Uh, the first one being the Chair of the Service Delivery Committee to write to the Director of the Service Delivery around a further deep dive regarding home fire safety visits. And that's against uh, the Chair of the Committee and the Director of Service Delivery. And for the second action, it's for the SFRS Operational Clinical Governance Framework, further discussion between the Chair of the Committee and the Deputy Chief Officer and Director of Training, Safety and Assurance on how best to take forward for future updates um, and again against the chair, the, the deputy chief officer and uh, the CEO for TSA. That's the two formal actions. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I was on mute. Excellent. Thanks very much. And the date of the next meeting is Wednesday the 31st of May at 10 o'clock.